Chapter 6 As Johnny used wire cutters to peel the rusty strands of tearing teeth out of the dying goat's hides, he could not help but wonder how Leah would have managed the bloody, stomach-turning task on her own. Somehow, he suspected that she would have found a way. As she went about the somber business of euthanizing most of Ramona Skunk Cap's goat herd, her calm, soft-spoken professionalism reminded him of a surgeon, hands gentle and deft, eyes watchful, mind ticking over any and all possibilities of saving the bleeding, agonized animals, more for their traumatized owner's sake than for the animals themselves. The animals whose wounds were not so severe were moved into Ramona's kitchen. Under the yellow glare of a solitary bulb hanging from the ceiling, Leah pumped drugs into the animals' veins and proceeded to sew up their injuries while Johnny held the trembling goats down on the newspaper-covered kitchen table. Ramona stood in the background, talking to herself and smoking one cigarette after another. At 4 a.m. Ramona went to bed, leaving Johnny and Leah to oversee the drugged goats themselves. On paper she found in a kitchen drawer, Leah wrote out explicit instructions on how to care for the animals over the next few days, how to clean the wounds, apply salves, administer antibiotics by crushing them into fine white powder and lacing it with honey in their feed. Leah would come back out in three days to check the goats for infection. She would remove the stitches in ten days. If Ramona had any questions or fears, she was not to hesitate calling Leah any time, day or night. Leaving Leah to clean up the bloody kitchen, Johnny went outside to wrap up the dead goats in plastic garbage sacks. He found a shovel in the garage and buried the animals in a hole he dug behind the goat shed. To avoid the coyotes from returning and digging up the corpses, he dragged a rusty oil drum over the grave. Then he returned to the kitchen. Leah sat in a chair, her head on the table, her eyes closed, cheek pressed into the blood-stained newspaper she had apparently failed to remove before falling asleep. She had not even managed to remove the rubber gloves from her hands. He wanted to turn his back on the scene and walk off into the dark put the memory of her lips parted in sleep back into his treasure trove of memories that had, over the years, numbed to the pain of losing her. Now here she was again, older, but just as beautiful, more beautiful because of life's hardships. The tiny lines around her eyes accentuated their depth of compassion. And those lips, always so easy to smile, to laugh, to kiss. They were bracketed now with slight creases. Not from smiling. No. He suspected that she did not do much smiling any longer. Johnny walked quietly to the table. He touched Leah's hair with his fingertips, disturbing a coil of golden brown strands that slid over her cheek. Laying his hand on her shoulder, he shook her gently. Leah. Honey, wake up. Leah? Her lashes fluttered and she slowly raised her head. She gradually lifted her eyes up to his. He grinned. Sleepyhead. Do I gotta carry you out of here? Groggy, she looked around, her momentary confusion almost comical. Sorry, she finally murmured. I must have dozed off. Must have. She rubbed her eyes, smearing blood across her brow. Johnny caught her hand and removed the glove, tossed it into the sink, then removed the other one, flinging it the way of the first. Then he lifted her out of the chair, his left arm under her knees, the other cradling her back. Her head just naturally dropped to his shoulder, cozied against his neck, her lips slightly pressed against the flesh of his throat where his pulse suddenly raced like the heart of a startled deer. I can walk, she whispered. Sure you can. Johnny exited the house, stood for a minute in the bracing air that rushed off the mountain to announce the first stirrings of dawn, then tucked her into the passenger seat of his truck, easing the seat back so she could sleep more comfortably on the trip home. The point above Brown Bear Lookout had, once upon a time, looked down on the River Road Drive-In, the only drive-in movie theater still standing in the late 80s in the entire southern New Mexico area, open on Friday and Saturday nights from dusk to dawn, and only during the summer months, it specialized in B-rated movies that portrayed violence and raunchy sex as normal to everyday life, as a Norman Rockwell painting did family togetherness. Brown Bear Point had been a haven for young lovers. 
On those summer weekends, pimple-faced adolescent boys and their starry-eyed dates would line their parents' cars up side by side under the pretense of watching the movies below for nothing. But within minutes the windows, rolled up to muffle the sounds of intimacy coming from the backseat, were fogged with condensation. Rumor was three-fourths of the babies born out of wedlock in the area had been conceived at Brown Bear Point. That had been before the junkies and dope dealers decided the point was secluded enough to carry on their drug trade, sending the lot of hormone-driven teenagers to search out less dangerous rendezvous places. Johnny had never brought Leah here, would not have dreamed of it. He'd cared too much for her reputation. He had, however, come here alone occasionally, long after the lovers had all gone home, and watched the sun creep over the mountains. With the morning sun warming his face and making him drowsy, he imagined building a house for himself and Leah in a place such as this, where the only noise to disturb the dawn peace was the trilling of birds. He imagined carrying her outside on those sparkling, fresh mornings, laying her on a blanket of green summer moss and making love to her beneath shaded trees. What had brought him back here today, he could not guess. Maybe because he simply was not ready to take Leah home yet. Maybe because some perverse, masochistic need to watch the pale sun kiss her cheeks one more time had taken hold of his logic. Leaning back against the driver's door, right leg Jack knifed on the console, he sipped hot coffee from a styrofoam cup and watched as her eyes slowly opened and her head lifted. She stared out at the ball of butter-yellow fire suspended above the distant mountain peaks that were splashed in gold and red streaks. Where am I? Her voice sounded dry and weak. Brown bear point. She looked at him, confusion deepening the creases around her eyes. How long have I been sleeping? An hour. He motioned to the McDonald's sack on the dashboard. There's coffee if you want it. Cream, no sugar as I recall. There's also a Danish. You still like apple, don't you? You have a memory like an elephant. She reached for the sack. Mind telling me what we're doing here? Your guess is as good as mine. Sometimes I think this truck has a mind of its own. She dug like a child into the sack, licking her lips as she pulled out the apple danish in cellophane. Let me. Taking the package from her, he tore it open. Leah watched, a partial grin on her mouth. You were always a take-charge kind of guy, Johnny. I could do it myself, you know. Just thought you might get tired of doing everything yourself. I'm used to it. She tore the bun in two and proceeded to eat, her lids fluttering in pleasure as her tongue slid along her lower lip, capturing slivers of cinnamon and icing. God, I feel as if I haven't eaten in a month. We could go somewhere that serves bacon and eggs if you want. She shook her head and looked out at the sun. This really is beautiful, Johnny. Aside from Whitetail Peak, it's my favorite place to kick back and get my thoughts in order. They remained silent for a while as Leah finished the roll, her gaze locked on the horizon as if she dared not look at Johnny. She was nervous, he could tell. The plain fact of the matter was, so was he. Hell, he'd dated some of the most beautiful models in the world, had betted a few movie stars who thought it would be cool to screw an Indian, and none of them had stirred the hunger in him as Leah Foster once had. And still did, apparently. Leah took a deep breath and, without looking at him, said, Why did you really bring me here, Johnny? Hell if I know, he replied softly. I really don't think it's wise. Why? We're not the same people we were twelve years ago. Yes, we are. Maybe our lives have gone different directions, but too much water under the bridge. Oh, I forgot. We burned that bridge, didn't we? The fact is, it's still burning. It burns a little hotter every time you slander my father to the press. I don't want to talk about your father. Why won't you leave him alone, Johnny? I said, how could you go on 2020 and say what you did about his involvement in the reservation casinos? You're still holding on to your bitterness because he came between us, and what you perceive that he did to your father. If you're referring to my father's blowing his head off. I don't blame your old man for that. I blame my father. He made that decision. He pulled the trigger. He took the coward's way out. I'm just trying to protect my people. They've been screwed over by a blind system for too long and you know it. 
Leah opened the door and jumped from the truck. Johnny followed. He moved around the truck and caught her arm, pushed her back against the truck, pinning her to the fender. I didn't bring you here to fight, he told her. Right now I don't give a damn about your father. Right now all I want to do is lay you over the hood of this truck and make love to you like I used to. Because the memory of my body inside of you has not at my brain ever since I saw you standing there in the rain the other night. Because I want to slide my tongue inside you again. And I want to hear you sigh in pleasure. I want to feel you shiver in ecstasy. Because I've never enjoyed being with a woman like I did with you. Stop, she whispered as hot color crept up her cheeks. Just, stop saying those things. They're cruel. He slid one hand around her neck, fingertips threading through the fine hair along her nape. His thumb slid along the shell of her ear as he moved his body against hers, the erection in his jeans and unbearable pressure that made his skin sweat. Every time I thought of your husband fucking you I wanted to kill him Leah. I wanted to take all the old anger I had for your father and turn it on a man I didn't even know. I still do. Because I can't get beyond the feeling that you're mine. What's here is mine. He slid one hand between her legs where her jeans were warm and moist. She felt as if she were melting over his fingers. Ah oh Christ, he groaned, then kissed her. Her mouth quivered. Opened. His tongue danced against hers, inviting, luring, seducing a moan from her throat that made him shake. He clutched at the snap on her jeans. The zipper gave easily from the pressure of his hand sliding beneath her French-cut panties. He knew without looking they would be pink and trimmed with lace. He knew how they would hug the swells of her buttocks and dip slightly into the cleft of her lips, cupping them like a man's gentle but craving palm. She caught his wrist as she had the first time he'd gotten fresh with her, hungry to experience her inexperienced body, wanting to know her like no other man had known her, knowing even as she tried to deny him the liberty that she wanted and needed it just as much as he did. The loose jeans slid down her hips as he laid her body back on the truck. He moved in between her legs, his own spread slightly, his free hand plucking at his belt buckle, hearing it tap against the truck as he unzipped his fly. Ah, the memory of their old passion, exploding like fireworks, uncontained, shimmering, and breathtaking. Red and blue and green and gold splashing against a sky of vibrant black, it had never been like that with anyone else. Never. Never. He laid his body down on hers, kissed her lips, her chin, her nose. Tears slid from her eyes and down her temples. Her chin quivered. Johnny frowned as she placed one hand against his cheek, caressing it as she tried to smile bravely. Please, she said. We're not kids anymore, Johnny. Consequence means something now. I just don't think I can handle this at this point in my life. Taking a deep breath, Johnny closed his eyes. The rush of testosterone that belonged more to an 18-year-old than a 30-year-old subsided like water down a drain. Laying his head on her breast, he whispered, Sons E-E-R-A, why can't I forget how much I loved you? They drove home in silence. Leah gazing out at the awakening countryside that sparkled with morning dew. Dozy drivers on their way to work listened remotely to their car radios and contemplated their day of dealing with tourists with more money than good sense, making the trip back to Leah's more tension fraught than it might have been otherwise. Johnny pulled into Leah's driveway just after seven. Shamika stood on the porch, hand cupped over her eyes to shield them from the glare of the sun. Her initial expression of concern melted into relief as Leah jumped from the truck and waved. Johnny shifted into park and killed the engine, staring after Leah as she moved down the pebbled walkway, the crumpled McDonald's sack in one hand. She did not look back. He left the truck and followed her. Shamika regarded them both with an expression somewhere between irritation and amusement. You two look like something the cat dragged in. Try a pack of hungry coyotes and you've just about hit the nail on the head, Leah replied, tossing her the sack. I'm dead. I'm getting a shower, then I want to see Val before he's off to school. He joining you? Shamika grinned. Leah flashed Shamika a look that made her eyebrows rise, 
Then she turned on Johnny so suddenly he nearly plowed into her. What little vulnerability had softened her features earlier had vanished. I appreciate your help, Johnny. More than you know. And thanks for the breakfast. Thanks for the breakfast? That's it? Yeah. She nodded. That's it. Turning on her heels, Leah brushed by Shamika and disappeared into the house. Shamika watched her go, shaking her head before looking back at Johnny. I was just about to cook up some pancakes for Val. Would you like to join us? No, he wouldn't, Leah yelled from the house. Appearing at the door again, her cheeks flaming with color, she said, I'm exhausted and filthy and... I'd like to spend some time alone with my son. Perhaps some other time? She gave Johnny a thin smile before turning away. Sorry, Shamika said. Come to think of it, you look as if you could use some sleep yourself. Right. He headed for the truck. Mr. Whitehorse? As Johnny looked around, Shamika said, don't take it personally. The reflection in the bathroom mirror resembled something out of a Boris Karloff movie. Her hair looked as if it had not met shampoo in a week. Smudged mascara around her eyes made her look like a raccoon. Not just any raccoon, but the one she'd parked near those hours ago, squashed, bloody, and bloated, and she suspected that she did not smell much better. Newspaper print had been stamped down one side of her face when she'd fallen asleep on Ramona Skunk Cap's kitchen table. If she squinted just right, she could make out the words, no arrests have been made, reversed across her right cheekbone. How could Johnny possibly have found her alluring enough to want to make love to her on the hood of his truck? Shamika moved up behind her and regarded her reflection before shaking her head. I'd say any man who was willing to look at you over breakfast has got to have the soul of a saint. Johnny is no saint. Believe me. Maybe I gave him too much credit. Maybe he's just blind. Leah moved to the shower and turned on the hot water full blast. So what is the real reason you were so rude as to tell Mr. Whitehorse to scram? Unbuttoning her shirt, Leah moved into her bedroom, leaving Shamika to regulate the water temperature before steam totally filled the small room. She tossed the shirt onto a pile of dirty clothes near her closet door, then peeled her jeans down her legs, kicking them the way of the shirt. You know what I think? Shamika asked. I suspect you're going to tell me. I think it's time you start back to your support group. It's been a while, you know. She unsnapped her bra and flung it on the bed. You got a lot stored up in you that you need to get out, girlfriend. You're right. I'll go this afternoon. Shamika's mouth dropped open. She centered her eyes on the ceiling as Leah wiggled out of her panties and returned to the bathroom. Scuse me if I'm speechless, Shamika yelled. I can't remember a time that I didn't have to strong arm you to get you to go. With hot water pounding her shoulders and head, Leah turned her face up into the spray and closed her eyes. Every muscle in her body hurt. So did her heart every time she thought of Johnny's hands on her, the taste of his mouth on hers, like sweet rich coffee. How could she have allowed herself to weaken so? You still going out with Sam tonight? Shamika called. Why shouldn't I? Just thought you might change your mind since you and Johnny. Leah reached for the shampoo and squeezed the apple essence soap into her palm. Me and Johnny what? For your information, Johnny is deeply involved with someone named Dolores. How do I know? Because I found her makeup bag and storehouse of condoms in his truck. Are you telling me that there was none of the old spark between you these last few hours? I'm telling you that I intend to continue seeing Sam. I like him. He's a very nice guy. He's no Johnny Whitehorse. Leaning back against the shower wall, shampoo running in streamers over her breasts, Leah closed her eyes and thought, no, he's no Johnny Whitehorse. But then, who is? Chapter 7 Dolores's Mercedes convertible was parked under the big pine near the stone bench Johnny bought back in 1995 during an acting job in Puerto Rico. He situated his truck next to it and sat back in his seat, engine running, his eyes vaguely registering the activity in the distance, 
Roy Moon climbing up on the big red tractor and preparing to drag the exercise track before the horses were brought out for their morning workouts. Jose Ramirez was leading a rambunctious yearling to a turnout paddock, and a young man named Joe Two Rivers, whom Roy had hired the week before, was pushing a wheelbarrow full of manure and shavings out of the main barn. The feelings inside Johnny coiled like a spring. He had not experienced desire like he had that morning at Brown Bear Point since the last time he'd been in Leah's presence. The sort that drove a man to act like a fool. To let the base hunger overwhelm judgment. To let the heart shout louder than the whispers of logic in his head. She did not love him any longer. It was that simple. Her response to his kiss had been a physical urge, nothing more. Or an attempt not to totally humiliate him. She had always been very good at avoiding hurt feelings. If there had been a most thoughtful category in high school she would have won that too, along with most beautiful. The truck door opened suddenly, snapping Johnny out of his memories. Dolores, in tight starched jeans and an Anne Klein blouse, stared at him as if were Jeffrey Dahmer. My God, she gasped. Is that blood all over you? He looked down at his shirt and the front of his jeans, which were stained and crusty with goat blood. Yeah, he replied. I guess it is. The color drained from her face. Are you all right? What's happened? My God, Johnny, I've been worried out of my mind. Not my blood. He smiled to assure her. Ramona skunk caps goat's blood. Coyotes again. What were you doing at Ramona's? Her gaze fell on an unused syringe and a roll of vet wrap that had fallen on the floor of the passenger seat, and her shoulders squared. You've been with Leah, haven't you? Her truck broke down. I happened by. Took her out to Ramona's. Took her home. He shrugged. Here I am. She studied his face, his eyes, his lips, her look telling him that she did not totally believe him. Johnny reached for her makeup bag and handed it to her. Forgot something. Her fingers reached for the zipper and unzipped it slowly as she peered inside. They're all there, he told her, killing the engine and sliding off the seat. Count them. Only one missing. Of course, you know me and condoms. Never could get used to the damn things. Could have screwed a dozen women since I saw you last night and just couldn't be bothered to use them. He slammed the door and walked toward the house. You're awfully testy this morning, she said behind him. It's been a long night. I tried calling you. I heard from my source. He says he might have information soon on Senator Foster's link with Formation Media, and FM's looking more suspicious by the day. If you're still interested, of course. Why wouldn't I be interested? Why don't you tell we? Entering the house, Johnny unbuttoned his shirt. By the time he reached the bedroom he'd peeled it off and proceeded to unbuckle his belt. He walked directly to the bathroom, to the shower, and turned on the water full blast and as hot as he could tolerate. By the time Dolores entered the room he had removed his boots and socks, and was dragging his jeans down his legs. Normally by this time you would be demanding more information about my source than I could possibly tell you. You'd be gloating over the fact that you're soon going to have Foster's ass on a plate. I told you, honey, you're tired. Sure. You had a long night. Dolores leaned her shoulder against the wall and crossed her arms as Johnny stepped into the glass shower stall and into the deluge of pounding, steaming spray. The water felt like a thousand tiny, blistering needles sinking into the tight muscles of his back and shoulders. Propping both hands against the wall, he allowed his head to fall forward, offering the back of his neck to the soothing fingers of hot water, holding his breath as it poured down over his black hair, his brow, his eyes, his lips. The stall door opened. Dolores stepped in, still dressed but barefoot. As Johnny turned his head to look at her, she grinned and slid between him and the wall. You look like a man in desperate need of a little TLC, Mr. Whitehorse. You're going to ruin your Anne Klein, sweetie. So I'll buy me another. Or you can buy me another. How's that? Taking up the soap, she rolled it in her hands, then slid it down his chest, to his belly, then lower. He caught her wrist, and grinned. I'm dead. Really? Maybe after I get some sleep. 
Since when have you ever been too tired for a blowjob, Johnny? Since I stayed up all night sewing up goat entrails and burying a woman's pets so mangled up by barbed wire you could hardly tell what they were any longer. But you've always said that sex renews your vitality. Dolores eased down onto her knees, her hands sliding between his thighs. Did you make love to Leah, Johnny? Closing his eyes, he shook his head. Not even a kiss, for old times' sake? He twisted his fingers into her hair and gritted his teeth. Did you? Kiss her? Groaning, Johnny fell back against the shower wall, allowing the water to cascade down his chest and belly, onto Dolores's head and shoulders. It poured down her cheeks and into her mouth as her lips parted, sliding like a tight-fitting glove onto his organ, which had become aroused despite himself. Yes, he finally replied. I kissed her. For old time's sake. And did you enjoy it? No. He shook his head and turned his face into the hot spray. No. You never had the kind of sex with her that we have, did you, Johnny? She flicked him with her tongue, fast, like the fluttering of a hummingbird's wing. She never gave me a blow job, if that's what you mean. She was too, innocent. I would never have asked it of her. What about now? Would you ask it of her now? Would she go down on you like I do, do you think? He closed his eyes. His fingers, bunched in Dolores's wet hair, gripped her head as his entire body turned hard as stone and his breath caught somewhere in his chest and would not budge. Leah's face shimmered before his mind's eye like a rainbow through the runnels of silver water flowing from his brow, her incredible blue eyes drowsy with passion, lips swollen by his kiss, cheeks flushed with a desire that both mystified and embarrassed her. With a groan and a pump of his hips, he succumbed like flotsam in a whirlpool to the pull of Dolores's mouth. A hematoma the size of a tennis ball had sprouted on Johnny's mare's stifle. Leah briefly considered using that as an excuse not to live up to her promise to Shamika to go to her support group that afternoon, but, at the last minute, she climbed into Shamika's van and drove into town. Her attendance of the support meetings had been sporadic the last few weeks. When she felt strong, she braved the challenge. When she felt weak, she holed up in her house and buried her head in animal medicine. But, as Shamika pointed out, it was the times that she felt the weakest that she needed support the most. And she was feeling pretty damn weak today, and all because of Johnny. Shelly Darman, a beautiful honey blonde with sparkling blue eyes and a model's lithe figure, smiled brightly as Leah entered the room. She waved and motioned to the empty chair next to her. Others turned, rewarding Leah with welcomes and outstretched hands whose touches were as firm and assuring as anchors in turbulent water. Shelley hugged her, holding her close even as Leah tried to pull away. It's been much too long, she said. How is Val? Doing great. It's me I'm not so sure about. That's why we're here. Leah eased down into the folding chair that was one of a dozen situated in a circle, spoke and smiled to the women who seemed eager to draw her into conversation. Yes, her vet practice was starting to take off. No, she had not gotten around to reading the James Harriet books yet, but she would, she promised, as soon as she got caught up with all her paperwork, and, no, she had not yet received the special needs parent bulletin. Was there anything exciting to report? No new medications? Theories? Certainly, she would be happy to help their fund drive. To say the children needed a new school bus was an understatement. The way it limped up the road, she was surprised that it ever made it to school. Would Senator Foster consider sponsoring the drive? His influence, and the fact that his own grandson had been afflicted with cerebral palsy, would bring statewide if not nationwide interest to their plight. He could certainly spearhead the drive to get the government to cough up more money for future research. She would speak to him, of course. But they must understand politicians. So much to do and so little time to do it. The meeting came to order. Shelley welcomed the newcomers, then invited them to stand and introduce themselves. Tom and Betty Thackeray were in their early thirties. He was an insurance salesman. She was, or had been, a CPA for a local accounting firm. 
They had waited 10 years to have a child, making certain there was money and savings to handle the costs. They'd bought a nice house with a big backyard because they believed children needed a lot of space to run and play in. Their daughter had been born two months premature. First, the baby seemed fine. It wasn't until she was nearly eight months old before they realized there was a problem. It began with seizures. The doctors could not tell them for sure how the damage had been caused. Could have been due to the early birth, as was most cases of CP. Betty blamed herself. Obviously, she had not done something right during her pregnancy. They didn't know if they could cope with the aspect of caring for a handicapped child for the rest of their lives. They were struggling with guilt over the fact that they did not want to. Why were they being punished? What had they done in their lives to warrant God's burdening them with such a catastrophe? Why, dear God, could the child not have died in delivery and saved them all from this nightmare? Betty wept into her hands, fingers hiding her shamed face, shoulders shaking as her husband hugged her, consoled her, and cried himself. Shelley went to Betty and took her in her arms. We've all thought the same thing. Why us? What could we have done differently? And there are times still, when we look out on a normal world full of normal children and ache to see our own chase kites, and play ball, and tap dance in tutus on a stage before proud giddy parents. We would love to go out in public with our children and not be stared at with pity and morbid curiosity. We would love to go into a restaurant or a movie without fearing the reaction of others. We would love to grow deaf to the taunts and jeers of healthy children whose cruelty stems from ignorance and not meanness. We would love to know the feel of our own son's and daughter's arms around our necks, of their warm, wet kisses on our cheeks, of their squeals of pleasure on Christmas morning. But those pleasures are so minor compared to the moment your little girl finally manages to say, Mama, to reach for your hand, to read her first word. Or the sparkle in her eyes when she knows she's pleased you. She may never walk, or run, or gather daisies in a meadow and present them to you on your birthday, but she will love you, never doubt that for a moment. Her brain may be damaged, but not her soul. It is as vibrant and strong as a thousand healthy bodies. Let it carry you, and you both will learn to soar with eagles. Dana Carpenter sat forward in her chair, elbows on her knees, hands clasped loosely together. I remember when my son was born prematurely. I told my best friend, I don't think I can cope if something goes wrong with my baby. And she said, yes, you will. You will because you have to. God never gives us more to bear than we can handle. Now I like to think that God gifted me with my son because he thought I was special. Shelley took her chair and crossed her legs. My husband left me when Michael was still a baby. Hell, I hadn't worked in several years. The only job I could expect to get was answering phones. That salary wouldn't even cover paying for private daycare for my son, much less his therapy and medications, which were running nearly $3,000 a month. Fortunately, my husband might have been stingy with his emotional responsibilities, but he has lived up to his financial ones. He carried all the expenses while I went back to school and got my teaching degree. Now I get to work and enjoy the same holidays as Michael. I can afford to hire a nanny who comes in and gets Michael ready for school, and is there in the afternoon when he gets home. And to top that off, are you ready for this, ladies? I met a man. The group whooped and high-fived one another as Shelley beamed. Yep. Just when I thought I'd grow old and gray before ever finding a man who wanted to shoulder the responsibility of a special needs child, I meet this incredible man when I took Michael up to Rockaway Ranch. He volunteers twice a week at the ranch, helping with the horses and children. He and Michael hit it off immediately. We started seeing one another and... I'm feeling really good about this relationship. I don't have to be terrified of some joker finding out about my son and dumping me like a hot potato. She wiggled her eyebrows and added, did I mention he's a hunk? Laughter around her as Leah looked from one face to another, smiling herself, feeling any moment as if she would implode. Leah? She looked around at Shelley. You look as if you'd like to say something. She opened and closed her mouth, shrugged, bit her lip. 
Are you still seeing Sam? Dana asked. We have a date tonight. Have you introduced him yet to Val? No. She shook her head. Shelly smiled. Have you told Sam yet about Val? Leah lowered her eyes. No, she replied more softly. Because. Because the last time I grew fond of a man, the moment I introduced him to Val he split. Then obviously you've grown fond of Sam or you wouldn't worry about him taking a hike, Shelley said. No. Not really. He's a nice guy. It's just that, it's nice to be with a man sometimes. To go out. See a movie. Get dinner. Yes, but eventually you're going to want to commit yourself. To get serious. Not with Sam. He doesn't do that for me. Are you sure? Maybe you're simply afraid of falling for him too deeply. You're not going to allow yourself such freedom until you know exactly how he's going to respond to Val. Maybe. She shrugged. I just think, at this stage, I haven't bothered introducing them because I don't see a future for us, regardless of Val. Someone changed the subject, and with a sense of relief, Leah relaxed back in her chair, aware that she had refused to speak up and say what she'd come here to say. That a man she once loved with all her heart had stumbled back into her life, stirring up all the old yearnings of desire and fantasies, all the old anger and confusion over his feud with her father and how Johnny ripped her heart, not to mention her loyalties, in two and oh God, she could so easily allow herself to fall for him again, despite her father, but there was Val, always Val, and while she could handle any other man turning his back on her and her son, she could not handle Johnny doing it and because of that she wanted to hide Val, tuck him out of sight so for the first time in years she could grasp that fragile glass rope of happiness before she drowned 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 in loneliness and self-pity. The two hours flew by. Session over, the group met at a table cluttered with punch and cookies and brochures about coping with special needs problems and products for special needs children including wheelchairs, walkers, and silverware that was crooked to facilitate eating. Leah picked up the pamphlet about the wheelchairs and studied the $4,000 price, frowning. Ridiculous, isn't it? Shelley said, handing her a cookie. When you're ready, I have a friend who can get the same chair 20% cheaper. Will your insurance cover any of it? There isn't any insurance. Shelley rolled her eyes. My God, how do you manage? I don't. Leah smiled. Val's outgrowing his chair like crazy. I simply can't afford $4,000, not unless I take him out of physical therapy. And that's out of the question. There are a number of financial aid programs out there that could help. I've contacted them. Hopefully I'll hear something soon. But you know how it is. The waiting lists for these organizations are astronomical. It may take up to a year just to make our way onto the list. Would you like to talk about Sam? Leah broke the cookie apart, amazed and amused at Shelley's ability to read people's emotions. It's not Sam I'm afraid of. Someone has come back into my life and I'm terrified of my feelings for him. The one who got away, ha. Huh? My fault. I'm surprised he even speaks to me. Is he still in love with you? I don't know. He kissed me. I'm not sure why. Maybe he was just all wrapped up in used to bees. I'm afraid he thinks I'm still the same person I once was. That I'm the same girl who thumbed her nose at consequences, rebelled against the demands and expectations of my father. The free spirit who, in her love for him, would have defied the world to protect him. He sounds very special. He was. And is. Then if he's so special, he should have no problem with Val. Should he? Leah tossed the crumbling cookie onto the table and sighed. I'm just too damned frightened of finding out. Sam Clark bought his clothes straight out of the Sears catalog. He did not care for shopping malls at all, though he would break down at Christmas time and shop at J.C. Penney and Dillard's for his mother's and sister's presents. That way he could put them on his charge cards and pay them out over time. He always managed to make the last payment before the next Christmas rush, at which time he would start all over again. Sam stood 5'8 in his bare feet. Same as Leah. She was always careful to wear shoes with little or no heel because she felt uncomfortable looking down at her date. 
Shamika once pointed out that Nicole Kidman was several inches taller than Tom Cruise, and Leah had pointed out that she wasn't Nicole Kidman, and Sam sure as hell wasn't Tom Cruise. Not even close. Sam outweighed gorgeous Tom by at least a hundred pounds. His scalp was showing through his thinning brown hair, and he had fingers like little Polish sausages. His breath always smelled like the wintergreen certs he carried in his shirt pocket. Leah waited for Sam on the front porch, sweater draped around her bare shoulders. She deliberated half an hour over what to wear. Not that she had a big choice. Her biggest decision had been over how much skin to reveal. She'd finally opted for a halter-style sundress that exposed her shoulders and most of her back. This was the third date with Sam, after all. She was allowed to relax a little. She'd swept up her hair in a banana clip, dabbed a touch of an Elizabeth Taylor knockoff perfume behind each ear and borrowed Shamika's pearl drop earrings. She'd dragged out makeup she had not used since the last time she'd gone out with Sam. A spot of pearlized warm copper on her eyelids, mocha mist on her cheeks, and brawn rose on her lips, all from the clearance table at the local five and dime. Sam pulled up to Leah's house at 7.30 sharp, driving a 1980 Eldorado Cadillac sporting dealer tags. Last date he'd shown up in a maroon Lincoln Continental with an interior permeated by cigar smoke. The time before that an Olds Cutlass boasting 200,000 miles and a crunched left bumper that was to be banged out at the local body shop the following Monday, before the car was put on the lot for sale, of course. He bounced from the car with his usual enthusiasm, hair slicked to one side to better cover the thin spot on top of his head. His coat was brown and gray plaid over an ochre-colored shirt and green trousers. His tie was red and blue pinstripes stamped with bucking horses. Leah smiled as Shamika began laughing somewhere in the house behind her. Randy's Bar and Grill on Cedar Creek Road served the best steaks in town. Sam could afford the best tonight, he informed Leah. He'd sold three cars that afternoon and was ready to celebrate. He'd called ahead for reservations, requesting a table outside on the patio overlooking the valley and the outdoor dance floor where a group specializing in 60s and 70s music were warming up their instruments. As usual, the place was packed with tourists, most in town for the races. Texans in ostrich boots and cowboy hats flashed wads of money and ordered beer and margaritas by the pitcher. A group of New Yorkers took up a table for twenty, all having disembarked the chartered bus parked across the road. By the looks of them they had stripped the local souvenir shops of every tacky made in Taiwan Native American relic within a fifty-mile radius. One man wore a headdress of painted chicken feathers and wielded a rubber tomahawk, causing his companions to hoot in laughter every few minutes. Looks like the old place is rumbling tonight, Sam said, showing Leah to her chair. We can go someplace else if you'd like. Wouldn't think of it. Besides, it's Friday night in tourist town. Every place will be packed. Sam took his chair next to Leah, flashing his this car has never been driven over 30 miles an hour and was owned by a little old octogenarian who only drove it on Sunday's smile at the teenage waitress dressed in a flamingo pink can can dress short enough to show off her frilly black petticoat. I called in earlier, he told her. Name Sam Clark. You got an order back there for me. Without a word, she turned on her spiked heels and elbowed her way toward the kitchen. Lacing his fingers on the table, Sam looked around the patio. The trees twinkled with firefly sized white lights. Candles burned under globe chimneys on each table, giving the area a fairy tale appearance. You're looking especially nice tonight, he told her. I like your earrings. And I like your. Tie. Sam looked pleased. Good. It's got horses on it. See? He flapped the thing at her. I wore it just for you. Thought you'd appreciate the equestrian motif. Where on earth did you find it? She asked, still smiling. Walmart. They'd marked it down from $7 to $3.50. Leftovers from their Easter sale, I think. Anyway, I found several I liked. Stocked up. Can't pass up a deal like that. They nodded in unison. Hope you like this kind of music. I seen in the paper that this group was going to be here tonight. 
I saw them once before down at the convention center and thought, what the heck? Why not? I like the oldies very much. They're my favorite. Yeah. He fluttered his tie again. Somehow you looked like the kind of gal who would enjoy a blast from the past. So who is your favorite? Neil Diamond. Yeah. He nodded. Ever seen him in concert? Puts on a hell of a show. Least he used to. Haven't seen him in oh, probably 20 years or so. I have every album he ever did. His early ones are my favorites, though. The waitress returned, wheeling an ice bucket stocked with a chilled bottle of champagne. Mum's extra dry. Not Dom Perignon, certainly, but neither was it Andre S. Sam's face lit up like a Christmas tree as he looked at Leah with an expression that made a knot form in her throat. Something was up, and she wasn't certain she was going to like it. Chapter 8 After much cajoling on Dolores's part, Johnny finally agreed to a night out, despite his lack of sleep and the fact that he was supposed to fly his Cessna up to Boulder in the morning and catch a flight to D.C., where he was to speak first thing Monday morning before a congressional committee regarding the situation with the Indian Trust Fund. With the top down on her Mercedes SL, Dolores's short black hair whipped freely in the night wind, as did Johnny's. The drive from Whitehorse Farm to Cedar Creek Road had been exhilarating, the mountain air biting their faces and taking their breath away. Johnny needed all the help he could get. His mind felt like mush. The idea of dancing away the next few hours was not high on his list of things he'd rather be doing. But, as usual, Dolores got her way. She always did. Which, he surmised, is what made her one of the finest reporters in the state. She simply did not know when to say no. Besides, she'd flogged him with enough guilt over his dalliance with Leah that he supposed he owed it to her. And maybe a few beers and some light music would get his mind off the memory of Leah's mouth opening under his that morning, the way it had the very first time he'd kissed her. Timid. Hesitant. Experimenting with passion. The valet hurried from his perch near the restaurant door obviously enthused over the prospect of driving Dolores's car. The young man recognized Johnny and Dolores immediately, thrust a pen and scrap paper at them and pleaded for their autographs. Dolores glowed as he gushed over her reporting. She was the only reason he watched the news that early, she deserved a network spot, best-looking babe on television. Had she ever thought about acting? Posing for Playboy? And Johnny Whitehorse, who would have thought it? Saw Johnny's jeans billboard on the Las Vegas Strip near the Mirage Hotel, Johnny standing three stories tall wearing unzipped jeans and no shirt, shit, man, awesome. My girlfriend gets turned on every time she sees it. Would Johnny sign the autograph to Karen, with lust? No? With love, then. That would do. Oh, by the way, heard a rumor Johnny was going to do a movie up in Arizona with Robert Redford and Kevin Costner. Any truth to it? A sequel to Dances with Wolves? No? Too bad. Was he really thinking about running for Senator Foster's seat in the next election? Wow, mind-blowing karma, huh? Get pissed at the Senate and take a few scalps, huh? Just think of it, Indian dude finally gets even for all the injustices put on his people by the white populace. Far out. Hello, I'm Candy. I'm your hostess tonight and, oh my god. You're Johnny Whitehorse, aren't you? Oh my god. Sarah. Sarah look who's here. Johnny Whitehorse. Oh my god. Mr. Whitehorse, we were talking about you just this afternoon. I just bought your poster, I've had it hanging up on my bedroom wall for the last three months. I loved you in that our episode. Oh, geez, you know, the one where you were shot during that demonstration. Is it true you're dating Cher? Doofus. He's with a date. Oops. Sorry. Hey, aren't you? Doofus. That's Dolores Rainwater. God, don't you know anything? She does the morning news, on Channel 10. Sorry. I don't watch the news. Mr. Whitehorse, would you please sign this menu? You will? Oh my God. I'm going to faint. 
Oh my god, I'm going to frame this and hang it over my bed so it's the first thing I see when I wake up in the morning. God, you're even more gorgeous in person than you are on your poster. And you're so tall. Oh my god Sarah, isn't he tall? I made my boyfriend buy those jeans you wear in that commercial where you're walking down 5th Avenue and traffic is crashing all around you and the women are hanging out of the office windows and whistling? Duh. Not even. He looks like a dork in them compared to you. Someone told me at school they'd read in People magazine that you've been offered a cola commercial, that they're going to use that same jeans commercial, only at the very end you're going to pop the tab off the cola and drink it, and all the drooling women rush to their soda machines to buy that drink. Shush. Randy is staring at us. Give them table 8 on the veranda near the band. Oh my god, Judy, your waitress, is going to die when she sees you. Thank you so much for the autograph, Mr. Whitehorse. Oh my god, I can't believe I actually met him. Oh my god. Sarah turned on her high heels and flounced away, menus tucked under her arm, blonde ponytail swinging side to side like windshield wiper blades. Dolores looked up at Johnny, her mouth curved in something just short of sarcasm. I'm surprised they didn't have an orgasm right there. Johnny grinned. You're just jealous because they didn't know who the hell you are. Need I remind you that the valet thinks I should be in Playboy? I'll give Hugh a call for you if you'd like. That's right. He tried to get you to do a layout with Miss October, didn't he? No, that was the publisher of Playgirl. Wanted me to be Mr. October. And you turned his offer down. Johnny Johnny Johnny. What you could have done with two million dollars. You know what they say, sweetheart. It's better to leave them guessing. Fantasy is usually more satisfying than reality. You're joking, right? One could hardly say that about you. Thank you. You're welcome. By the time they had crossed the main dining room, every patron, plus those at the adjacent bar, had noted Johnny's presence. Women squirmed in their chairs for a better look. Men rolled their eyes and glared at their wives and girlfriends, obviously annoyed at their blatant appreciation for another man. The band's rendition of John Denver's, Sunshine on My Shoulders, reverberated from the half-dozen speakers suspended in the clusters of trees scattered over the restaurant's well-manicured and landscaped grounds. A lone middle-aged couple, holding one another tightly, slid across the dance floor, oblivious to the tables of people watching them, too wrapped up in one another to care. Sarah scanned the crowd and the few empty tables Randy always kept set aside for his special friends who dropped by on the spur of the moment. You can sit near the band, but that's pretty loud. There's a more secluded table just back of that wall. You can still see the band from there but you're sorta hid from gawkers, ya yeah, know? She smiled and batted her eyelashes at Johnny. Dolores checked out the crowd. She would choose the most conspicuous table in the place, Johnny surmised. She always did. She liked attention. She liked being seen with him. It was damn good promotion. The more her photo showed up in the gossip rags, the better chance she had of landing a job with a more prestigious network affiliate. And he knew for a fact that her contract was up for renegotiation soon, which was the major reason she was so eager to sniff out dirt on Senator Foster. Breaking the story would get her worldwide recognition. Well, well, look who's here, she said. Johnny followed her gaze, to a table where a waitress was pouring champagne and a pudgy man with a receding hairline was reaching for his date's hand and, Dolores took off through the crowd, heading straight for Leah's table. Sarah fell in behind her. Johnny wondered if he could get away with murder in front of so many witnesses. My God, if it's not Leah Foster, Dolores said sweeping around the table to grab Leah in a hug. How long has it been, Leah? Twelve, thirteen years? You remember me, don't you? Dolores Rainwater? The smile froze on Leah's face as Johnny walked up. The flush that had accentuated her blue eyes moments before drained down her neck. But for a spot of hot color glowing just above her cleavage, she suddenly looked white as paper. Dolores, Leah repeated, forcing herself to focus on Dolores and not on Johnny. So, you're that Dolores, her tight smile said, the one who uses Estee Lauder lipstick and condoms ribbed for your enjoyment. 
Sure, I remember you. I watch you every morning. Dolores caught Johnny's arm and dragged him up beside her. You and Johnny have already gotten reacquainted, I understand. Our paths have crossed, yes. Leah reached for her glass of champagne and smiled at her date. The man stared at Johnny and Dolores with his mouth open, obviously starstruck and speechless. Sam, these are old friends of mine. We grew up together, sort of. Sam sprang out of his chair, dropping his napkin to the floor and knocking the table so hard the glasses tottered precariously. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Rainwater. Mr. Whitehorse. I know who y'all are. Geez Louise, I'm pleased to meet you both. Real honored. Leah never told me y'all were acquainted. Leah sipped her drink, still smiling, still refusing to look at Johnny. Her color was returning little by little, creeping up her shoulders, her throat, and fingering across her rigid jaw. Y'all here for dinner? Sam asked. Why, yes we are, Dolores replied. Well, you're welcome to join us if you want. Course, I can understand if you'd rather be alone, why Sam? What a wonderful idea. Wouldn't that be fun, Johnny? Dolores flashed him her most brilliant smile. We can kick back a few margaritas for old time's sake. Sure, he replied, aware he sounded sullen and pissed. Not sure he felt sullen and pissed because Dolores was making an ass of herself and embarrassing him, not to mention Leah, or because the moron who was Leah's date had been holding Leah's hand those moments before Dolores insinuated herself into their privacy. He pulled out Dolores's chair for her, whispering in her ear as she sat down, cute. Very cute, sweetheart. We're going to discuss this later. Aren't we? Smiling, Dolores whispered back, I'm counting on it. Johnny took the chair next to Leah. His knee brushed hers under the table. Without so much as a glance at him, Leah shifted in her chair, moving her legs out of his way. Hmm, champagne, Dolores said. Are we celebrating something? Sam motioned to the waitress, who stared at Johnny in a sort of daze. Hun, could you bring us two more glasses? You who? Ma'am? He chuckled and nodded toward Johnny. I reckon she's a fan. The waitress blinked and focused on Sam. Two more champagne glasses if you will, darlin. Sure. She nodded and moved like a robot toward the kitchen. Dolores laughed. God, you can't take Johnny anywhere that he doesn't cause a scene. You get used to it after a while. The women simply love him. I have to admit, I got two daughters back in Austin who think you're God's gift to women, Sam declared, shaking his head. They ain't ever gonna believe this. I'll bet Johnny would be more than happy to give you a couple of autographs to send them. That would be super. He searched his coat pocket and found a pen, but no paper, so he grabbed a couple of napkins. Just sign one to Debbie, and one to Linda. That's Debbie with an IE and Linda with a Y. Hell, my ex is going to be green with envy. She met Willie Nelson once. Ran into him on the street in downtown Austin. She's got his autograph framed and hung over the mantel in the living room. Just something else she got in the divorce. Johnny scrawled his name on the paper napkins as Leah continued to sip her champagne and Sam fidgeted like a nervous kid in his chair. Finished, Johnny shoved the napkins at Sam and said, So what were you celebrating? Sam? Celebrating? Oh. Ah. Well. His face flushed and he glanced at Leah. Our third date. How sweet, Dolores offered. I can see you're a real charmer, Sam. Sam reached for his glass, tipping it toward Leah before drinking it down in one long quaff. As the waitress returned with two glasses, the band struck up, heard it through the grapevine. The scraping of chairs was followed by a half dozen couples heading for the dance floor. The waitress took Dolores's order for a pitcher of margaritas for the table, then their food order, so flustered by Johnny's presence that she was forced to start over twice before getting it right. Dolores and Sam chatted through the margaritas and fajitas while Leah and Johnny stared into their drinks and did their best to listen to the music that was fast becoming diluted by the growing din of conversation and the clattering of dishes. Johnny did not have an appetite after all. Obviously Leah didn't either. 
She poked at her food and nibbled on greasy tortilla chips, pretending to be immersed in Dolores's and Sam's conversation, which focused entirely on Dolores's career. At one point, Johnny found his foot nestled against Leah's. He waited for her to move it. She didn't, and for a moment her eyes became distant, her expression dreamy. Was she thinking about yesteryears, when they would meet on the sly at Mojo's truck stop way out on Highway 70, halfway to Roswell, sit in the back booth with their legs pressed together and plan how she would sneak out of her room that night and meet him behind the stables? Or were the champagne and margaritas simply catching up with her? She'd never been one who could handle her liquor. It made her sleepy and romantic. A beeper sounded. Sam dug through his pocket and withdrew the credit card-sized machine. Looks like the boss needs me. You ladies excuse me while I use the phone? As Sam made his way toward the payphone, Dolores poured herself and Leah another margarita. What a pleasant man. He seems to adore you, Leah. Leah moved her foot away from Johnny's. Sam's a good guy. Is it serious? Define serious. Leah sipped her drink. Think you two will, you know. Get married? This is only our third date. So? There are a great many people out there who know the moment they meet someone that they're destined to be together forever. That's not the case with Sam. He's a friend. Nothing more. Smiling, Dolores looked at Leah sternly. I get the idea that Sam feels differently. He positively beams when he looks at you. Of course, who can blame him? You're still as lovely as you were in high school. Isn't she Johnny? Johnny tossed down the chip he'd been eating and gave her a flat smile. Prettier. Much prettier. In fact, I'd say she was the best-looking woman in this room. And probably the brightest. At least she knows when to keep her mouth shut. Goodness. Seems I've hit a nerve. Picking up her glass, Dolores toasted Leah. Here's to old friends and lovers. To pasts and futures. Johnny looked at Leah. I'd like to dance with you. As I recall you always enjoyed this song. Leah tipped her head, listening to the band's version of the Righteous Brothers, Soul and Inspiration. Pushing back his chair, Johnny reached for Leah's hand. If you say no, I'll probably make a scene. I'd hate that because it would wind up on the front page of the paper tomorrow, making me look like the ass I'm feeling like right now. He flashed a glaring Dolores a bright smile. Just for old time's sake. Right, sweetheart? With his fingers wrapped around Leah's wrist, he threaded their way through the tables and onto the dance floor. Pressed and jostled by swaying dancers, Johnny slid his arm around Leah's waist, entwined his fingers with hers, and drew her up against him, close. She felt rigid, her movements clumsy as they settled into the slide and S-way rhythm that Johnny set for them. So far, she had not said a word, just set her focus on the wall of bodies around her and appeared to tune Johnny out. Relax, he whispered. You feel as if you're going to shatter. I don't bite, unless you want me to. He grinned. Why do I get the feeling things are a little tense between you and Dolores tonight? It wouldn't have anything to do with our spending last night together, would it? Probably. Her head fell back as she looked up at him, her blue eyes serious. You told her? It's not like we have something to hide. I hardly call your practically undressing me on the hood of your truck innocent conversation. Just a kiss for old time's sake. You didn't tell her that. You know I don't lie, Leah. She asked me. I told her. No wonder she looks as if she'd like to scratch my eyes out. I don't blame her. He pulled her closer. Remember the first time we danced to this song? I'd bought that collection of old 45s at a flea market. I think I paid a whopping five bucks for the entire box. And we used your father's old phonograph to play them. The record kept skipping and I'd have to kick the player, and you broke the needle, my father got pissed, and you drove all the way to Alamogordo trying to find a needle to replace it. Yeah, well, the old man was pretty fond of that phonograph. He spun her around and drew her in again this time close enough that he could lay his cheek against the top of her head. Still using the same shampoo, I see. Apple. No wonder I was always hungry around you, 
He felt her laugh, and she relaxed, allowing her body to melt slightly into his. Turning his lips against her brow, he closed his eyes and allowed the essence of apple to filter through his senses until the heat of close bodies became a cocoon of memories of her and him dancing under a spray of pine trees to a tune he hummed in her ear. The song ended. The couples parted and shuffled back to their tables. Reluctantly, Johnny stepped away, releasing her hand only after she turned and moved back toward their table. He watched her walk, remnants of her childhood ballerina days still evident in her graceful stride, shoulders back, arms loose. She glided smoothly as a swan on water. Sam had returned. Dolores, however, was missing. Smiling as he moved around the table to join Johnny and Leah, Sam said, Dolores stepped away to speak to a friend. She'll be back directly. Mind if I dance with my date? Stepping aside, Johnny watched Sam take Leah's arm and escort her back to the dance floor. He thought, yes I do mind. If you hold her too close I'll pound out your brains, Sam old boy. You won't ever get the chance to sell another of the rolling crap cars you foist on unsuspecting customers. Leah and Sam were immediately swallowed by the couple sliding and spinning to the rhythm of a whiter shade of pale. Mr. Whitehorse, would you care for another drink? He looked around. The waitress smiled and stepped a little closer. A drink? She repeated, pointing to the empty margarita pitcher. Better not. I'm driving. She handed him a piece of paper. My phone number. Just in case, you know. If you got nothing better to do. Johnny smiled and tucked the paper into his pocket. Her eyes widened, her cheeks flushed. As she walked away, he dropped down into his chair, thinking about all the phone numbers women had shoved into his hands. No doubt they had waited by their phones for hours, days, believing he would call them on a whim and sweep them off to fantasy land. He often wondered what was worse for them, to sit around waiting for a call that never came, or to know that the minute they were out of sight he would toss their numbers into the nearest trash bin. The song ended. Another began. Where the hell was Dolores? Where the hell were Sam and Leah? He searched the dance floor, so packed with bodies that couples were forced to dance between the tables. Hey buddy. An overweight, bald man wearing a dyed chicken feather Indian headdress tapped Johnny on the shoulder, his jowls flushed by too many drinks, his eyes bloodshot. Where the hell was Dolores? How, the man said, grinning. How what? Johnny replied. You know. How? The man lifted his hand, palm out. How? Where the hell was Dolores? Don't you speak Injun? The man slurred. Johnny glanced at the table of snorting, chuckling tourists from which the drunken moron must have come. Another man got out of a chair, an instant camera clutched in both hands as he headed across the room, bouncing off diners and a waitress who nearly dropped her tray of empty glasses. The idiot in the headdress bent over Johnny so his breath rushed over his face, smelling like gasoline. You don't dress like no damn engine. Where's your loincloth and wolf teeth? You do speak white man's English, don't you? Wanna say something Cochise? You G? Hey Howard, the cameraman yelled. Put your headdress on him and I'll get a picture of you two together. Howard dragged the bonnet from his head, prepared to do just that. Johnny grabbed it, crushing the fragile feathers in his fingers as he slowly stood up, towering over the squat man who stumbled back, his grin sliding from his face. Hey, you broke my... Howard licked his lips and glanced around. The room had become suddenly silent as the patrons all stared, anticipating Johnny's reaction. What's everybody staring at? Geez, we're just having a little fun here. That's why we came here, ain't it? To look at the engines? Randy Morehouse appeared from nowhere, sliding in between Johnny and the tourist. Do we have a problem here, Mr. Whitehorse? Seems one of your customers has had a little too much to drink, Randy. Sorry about that, Johnny. Randy shot a look at the nervous tour guide, who had frozen in her shoes the moment Johnny got out of his chair. Carrie, you want to do something about the gentleman? And you, no photos please. He pointed to Howard's friend. The man looked at his camera, then back at Johnny. 
I'll pay him 10 bucks for a picture with my wife so we've got a snapshot of her with a real Indian. I don't think so, Randy replied, wagging his finger at the camera. 20 bucks, but he's got to wear the war bonnet. Johnny? Leah laid her hand on Johnny's arm. There is something to be said for tolerating ignorance. Your grandfather once said that such tolerance helps to make you wiser and stronger. He turned his back on Randy and the tourists, trying his best to ignore the explosive stab of anger and intolerance gouging at his raw mood. Like those years before, Leah's calmness slid around him like a cool blanket of crystalline water. How many times had he grasped that gentleness, that understanding, that acceptance she offered in a touch of her hand or a smile of her lips, and clung to it while his anger and frustration sent him on an emotional riptide? Had it not been for Leah those years ago he would have wound up in prison, a confused and furious young Native American like so many of his peers, fighting against a white man's establishment and prejudice that had destroyed their pride and future so many generations ago. Her hand still on his arm, Leah smiled. Think of who and what you are. What you've become. What you can and will stand for. Is punching him in the nose worth losing all of that? Besides, we both know you'll hate yourself in the morning. He took her hand from his arm, folding his fingers around it. Come home with me, he said. Her eyes widened, her lips parted. For an instant he was again looking down into a girl's eyes full of intense love, and the wing beats of memories fanned his anger into a much hotter flame, an inferno compared to his desire to pulverize a white man's face. But then... She stepped away, taking her hand and burying it in the folds of her sundress skirt. Can't. She lowered her eyes. Sam. Johnny raised his gaze to the used car salesman with his tacky tie and sweating scalp, standing in the background with his pudgy hands on his pudgy hips, his pocket full of napkins Johnny had signed for his no-doubt pudgy daughters back in Austin. Randy slapped a hand on Johnny's shoulder. Sorry about all this, Johnny. You know what they're like sometimes. They don't mean anything by it. He'll wake up with a hangover tomorrow and feel like a jerk. Look, I'm picking up the tab for this party. I don't want your fucking charity, Johnny snapped, and dragged his wallet out of his back jeans pocket, fingered out a stack of hundred dollar bills and tossed them on the table. He needed air. Desperately. Where the hell was Dolores? Turning his back on Leah, Johnny made his way out of the restaurant and stood for a moment on the front porch, allowing the night air to chill the heat from his face. A group of eight young Native American boys, barely into their teens, gathered in the parking lot beneath a vapor streetlight, dancing in a circle while another pounded on a drum and chanted. Their young faces were painted in stripes of colors. They wore cloaks of eagle feathers over their shoulders and down their arms, which did little to conceal their t-shirts jeans, and Nikes. Around them gathered smiling tourists, cameras popping with light and whirring video cams zooming in on the children's faces, which looked older than they should. The dance ended. The boys bowed, heads down, eyes down, shoulders bent, and fists hidden beneath their feathers as the onlookers tossed coins at their feet. The boys fell to their knees, scrambling to grab the glittering nickels and dimes and quarters, causing the tourists to laugh louder. Hey, Mr. Whitehorse. The valet moved out of the shadows, his hands in his pockets. If you're looking for Ms. Rainwater, she's out in her car. Johnny moved down the steps, shoved his way through the tourists, and grabbed a boy by the scruff of the neck, jerking him to his feet so hard the coins in the boy's hands sprayed across the asphalt. What the foo, shut up and listen to me. Johnny shook the boy and looked around at the others, all frozen in the process of stuffing their pockets with change. Don't ever go on your knees for a nickel or a dime or a quarter. Don't ever go on your knees for nothing or no one. Remember who you are and what you stand for. The boy twisted away and stumbled back, his look of anger exaggerated by the paint on his cheeks and brow. Look who's talking. Johnny Whitehorse. Big man who lives in big houses away from his people. You're nothing but an apple. Red man on the outside, white man on the inside. What do you stand for? What are you? No Apache, that's for sure. You walk in the white man's world now. 
To no veil nada, you are good for nothing. He spat on the ground, then motioned to the others. Silently, they turned their backs on Johnny and walked off into the dark. The tourists filed into the restaurant, leaving Johnny standing alone beneath the buzzing vapor light, coins shimmering around his feet. Chapter 9 Dolores sat in the passenger seat of the Mercedes, the car door open as Johnny moved across the parking lot, focusing more on the sick feeling of disgust in his stomach than the fact that a man was swiftly walking away from the car, dissolving into the shadows beyond the deserted highway. Music from the band drifted along the parked cars, the bass drum like a heartbeat tapping at the night as Johnny moved up to the SL where Dolores was hunkered over, so intent on what she was doing she did not hear him. A mirror compact lay open on her lap, several threads of white powder lined up side by side on the glass. With a clear glass straw she snorted the cocaine up one nostril, then the other, her groan of pleasure like a sigh of sexual gratification. Johnny closed his eyes. No, no, he wasn't going to jump to any conclusions here. He was not seeing Dolores Rainwater snorting powder into her brain. What the hell are you doing? He heard himself ask. Her head flew around and she stared up at him, her nose dusted with powder and her eyes like glass reflecting the distant streetlight. Oh. This, this isn't what it looks like, you idiot. You stupid, he grabbed the straw from her hand and knocked the compact from her lap. It landed on the asphalt, scattering the remainder of powder over the mirror. He ground his boot heel into the glass, pulverizing it as he crushed the straw in his hand, slivers of glass biting into his flesh like stinging ants. Dolores stared at the scattering of white powder and glass on the ground. Look what you've done. How dare you? Do you know how much that cost? Grabbing her purse, opened by her legs, Johnny dumped it on the ground, spilling makeup, credit cards, chewing gum, and a tiny plastic bag of more powder. Dolores flung herself onto it, snatching it up and clutching it to her stomach as she turned on him, face twisted, teeth showing behind her smeared lipstick. You self-righteous son of a bitch. How dare you come strutting out here and proceed to demean me when I just left you in there wrapped up with Miss Goody two shoes like you were a couple of teenagers with the hots for one another. You're a hypocrite, white horse. A two-timing egomaniac who thinks he was put on this earth to save the whole Indian nation. Well, I've got news for you. You're nothing. You're not an Indian and you're not a white man. You're an it with a dick between your legs. Keep your voice down, damn it, and get in the car. Get your hands off of me. She kicked at his shins and struck at his face as he shoved her back into the car and threw her purse in her lap. Slamming the door, Johnny dug the keys from his pocket and moved around the car, glancing at the restaurant where the valet was still standing, hands in his pockets, looking out at them as if not knowing, exactly, how to deal with the fact that Dolores Rainwater was screaming profanities like a drunken sailor. Johnny gunned the accelerator and the Mercedes jumped like a cat onto the highway, spitting gravel, tires squealing, back-end fishtailing onto the opposite lane, causing a trucker to swerve onto the shoulder and blow his horn. The cold night wind hit them with a blast that made Johnny catch his breath, but no way was he going to stop and put up the ragtop. Not now. Dolores crawled onto her knees, face in the wind. He grabbed at her arm. Sit down, Dolores, and put on your seatbelt. She stared at him, her hair plastered against one side of her face. You're still in love with her, aren't you? She yelled. Sit down, I knew it the moment you saw her tonight. It was written all over your face. You want her. You want to be with her. Despite the fact that you intend to destroy her father. She threw back her head in laughter. I hope I'm around to see her face when you prove that her father is up to his ass in casino corruption. I wonder how eager she'll be then to dance with you, much less fuck you. He grabbed for her arm. The car swerved, right tires slithering off the shoulder then back on again. Dolores reached under the seat and withdrew an envelope. She waved it at him. Just how badly do you want to prove that Senator Foster is corrupt, Johnny Honey? What's it worth to you? What's that? Information from my source. 
proof that Foster is linked to Formation Media. He stared at the envelope, forgetting, momentarily, the winding road ahead. Was this some sort of perverted joke? Dolores slid down into the seat, her smile turning smug. Well, what's it worth to you, Johnny? That depends on the price, he shouted. That you never see or speak to Leah again. That you announce to the papers tomorrow that you and I are going to get married. And then you're going to call your agent and ask that he take me on as a client, as a personal favor to you, of course. The car came out of nowhere, its bright lights suddenly reflecting off the rearview mirror, into Johnny's eyes. He hit the mirror with the butt of his palm, a sign to the inconsiderate driver to dim his lights. No chance. The car moved up behind him, inches from his bumper. Both hands on the wheel, Johnny glanced at Dolores. She had turned to look back at the car, her expression less dazed and angry now than suspicious. Put on your seatbelt, he yelled. Now, what the hell do they think they're doing? Put it on. She fumbled with the belt, yanking on it as it locked at her shoulder. The car rammed them, slamming Dolores against the passenger door. Johnny fought with the wheel, keeping the car from weaving into oncoming traffic. He checked his speed. 60. 65. He knew every bend in the road, how fast he could take the curves. Lots of practice in his father's old truck, pushing it to its endurance until it shuddered so hard he thought it would fall apart around him. Seventy, couldn't push it much more than that, not with the sharp bend coming up. No way he could make it at seventy. The lights flooded the SL as the car roared up behind him again, slamming into them, filling the night and the close forest with the sounds of crunching metal. No warning this time, the son of a bitch meant business. Dolores still fighting with the goddamn seatbelt. The car moved up beside him, a bulky, black thing with black windows, that careened against him, bouncing the Mercedes sideways, toward the shoulder that dropped off into nothingness. He hit the brakes just as the demon car slammed him again, metal grating against metal with a shriek like fingernails on a blackboard, whining like an animal in pain. Then it hit him, the reality, that they were going over the side, airborne, floating momentarily like an eagle, car slowly rotating, rolling like a lazy old cat that might have tumbled from a tree limb while napping. Dolores screamed, her hands outstretched toward him, the night gyrated with firelight and shadows, flames sluicing along trails of gasoline, shimming up the trunks of trees, lapping hungrily at the thick brown pine needles carpeting the ground. Horn blaring, the Mercedes lay like some dead armored armadillo on its back burning wheels resembling bonfires sending up acrid black smoke that formed a cloud close to the ground. The crumpled metal groaned and popped with the escalating heat. There came a hissing, like a snake, as if the machine were breathing its last. The explosion shook the ground. Sparks streaked into the sky and trees, drifting like dandelion fluff over the thatches of weeds and thistle before dying out. Hot waves radiated across the ground in a rush like heat from a suddenly opened oven. Shamika had left the front door of the house open. Light and music from a Sesame Street CD spilled through the old screen door, forming a dim yellow box on the orange front porch where Leah and Sam stood, thanking each other for a wonderful evening. It's early yet, Sam said, checking his watch. We could still make that movie if we hurry. Perhaps another time. Leah smiled and tugged her sweater more closely around her shoulders. Besides, I need to spend a little time tonight with my son. Sam looked around her, into the house. I'm real good with kids, you know. Are you? Heck, I got this way of communicating with them. Guess cuz I'm nothing but a big kid myself at heart. Your boy play sports? No. She shook her head. One of those intellectual types, huh? Probably spends his time on a computer. Leah looked around, into the house. She could hear water running. Shamika walked out of Val's bedroom, his pajamas tossed across her shoulder as she moved toward the bathroom, singing along with Bert and Ernie. I really should go Sam. Shamika is getting Val ready for his bath. I'm real good at giving kids baths. 
He smiled into her eyes, and Leah realized that the aspect of returning to his efficiency apartment to watch television on this Friday evening when the rest of the single world was humming with activity was as appealing to him as a stomachache. She knew the feeling all too well. The emptiness. The sounds of clocks ticking in the silence. The hours that dragged on, measured by late movies and reruns of Andy Griffith and I Love Lucy. Leah smiled back. All right, Sam. Maybe it's time for you to meet my son. He hitched up his pants and slapped his hands together as Leah reached for the screen door. Shamika came out of the bathroom, drying her fingers on a towel emblazoned with Cookie Monster. She stopped in her tracks when seeing Leah and Sam, hands falling still amid the terry folds of the towel. Hi, she said. You're back early. She looked around Leah and smiled at Sam. I was just getting Val ready for bed. Then we're just in time, Leah replied, removing her sweater and tossing it over the back of a chair. She kicked off her shoes and walked barefoot toward Val's bedroom. Coming, Sam? Sam, the used car salesman with two normal teenage kids back in Austin fell in behind her, rolling up his sleeves, relaying his girl's escapades in the bathtub. How Debbie once poured so much Mr. Bubble into the water she'd filled up the entire bathroom with suds, and Linda, the little minx, locked herself in the bathroom when she was only two and the water was running in the tub. They'd been forced to replace the carpet, not to mention remove the lock from the door. Valentino's star lay on his bed, naked but for his diaper, his legs twisted into odd curvatures due to the rigidity of his muscles. He let out a squeal when he saw her, and his arms floundered helplessly in an attempt to reach out to her. His blue eyes twinkled and he smiled with only one side of his face. Mama home, he yelled. Yes, Mama is home. She grabbed his face and kissed his cheek. He squealed again and managed to turn his head, pressing his lips against her cheek. Mama hold me? Mama's going to bathe you. Val no bathe. Val rather stink. No Val of mine is going to stink. She tweaked his nose, then blew a raspberry against his stomach. He squirmed and bucked, filling the tiny room with laughter. Leah slid her arms under his shoulders and lifted his upper body slowly, giving his rigid muscles time to gradually relax so he could bend at the waist and sit up. His head fell back onto her shoulder as she wrapped her arms around his chest for support. Only then did she look up at Sam. Standing in the door, he stared at her with a look of shock and despair. Sam, this is my son Val. Val, can you say hello to Sam? Without moving his head, Val peered at Sam from the corners of his eyes. Sam, he repeated, smiling broadly. Sam opened and closed his mouth, looking like one who had just discovered that the trapdoor beneath him had dropped open with no warning. Would you mind taking his feet for me, Sam? We'll carry him into the bathroom before removing his diaper. Nodding, Sam moved cautiously to the bed, eyes roaming the room, refusing now to focus on Leah or Val. He took Val's feet and they lifted him from the bed, made their way out into the hall where Shamika was leaning against a wall, arms crossed, towel draped over one wrist. Had I known I was going to get the night off, I'd have got myself a date, she said. Leah laughed. I'm sure it's not too late. Randy's place is really humming tonight. Randy's nothing. I've got a good mind to head out to Mojo's, where the truckers are good looking and the jukebox is rocking. Be my guest. I can hold down the fort here. Leah and Sam shuffled Val into the bathroom, where Shamika removed his diaper and tickled his tummy, causing him to shout and laugh. Last year Leah had saved enough money to purchase a tub chair, a thousand-dollar plastic seat that allowed Val to sit reclined in the water, strapped for security into its curvatures, which had been formed specifically for his body. She buckled Val in and reached for a washcloth and soap, glancing around at Sam where he sat on the closed lid of the toilet, staring at her with hound dog eyes. Thanks. I can take it from here. Why don't you go get to know Shamika while I finish up bathing Val? I'll call you when it's time to get him out. He nodded. Then nodded again. Slowly standing, he walked from the room. A collection of rubber ducks bobbed in the warm bathwater as Leah gently washed her son's body, crooning to him, 
smiling as his eyelids grew heavy, as they always did in the tub. The warm water relaxed him and eased the rigidity somewhat in his muscles, allowing him to more easily mold to the chair. From the living room came sounds of adult conversation, an oddity that somewhat unnerved her. Closing her eyes, she floated on the tones as easily as Val's ducks did on the water. Laughter. Footsteps. The tunes from Sesame Street cut off abruptly, replaced by television chatter. Her mind drifted back to earlier that evening, and she was again drawn close to Johnny's body, so familiar after so many years. He'd held her the same, like a treasured possession, their bodies swaying to music, their faces painted by candlelight. Come home with me, he'd whispered. Come home with me. Mama sad? Val asked. Leah blinked, spilling tears down her cheeks. She quickly blotted them away with the washcloth, smiling into her son's concerned eyes, which seemed a thousand lifetimes wise. No, Mama's not sad. Val makes Mama very very happy. Bath done, Shamika and Sam returned, bundled Val up in towels, hoisted him to his bed and proceeded to vigorously dry him. As Leah tugged his pajama bottoms up his legs, Shamika buttoned his top, discussing hers and Val's plan for tomorrow. No school meant fun day. Perhaps they would go to the park, or down to the fish hatchery. If Mama had no emergency calls, maybe she would join them. Would Val like pizza for supper tomorrow night? If he was good and cooperated with his exercises in the morning, she might even make homemade pizza, because that was his favorite, with diced up pieces of pepperoni and sprinkled with M&Ms. Leah tucked Val into bed while Shamika and Sam returned to the living room. Sam had relaxed enough to ask questions. What, exactly, was the extent of Val's cerebral palsy and mental retardation? What had caused it? Turning out the overhead light, Leah sat on the edge of Val's bed, watching his eyes grow drowsy in the pale beam of the smiling plastic clown on the wall. With shadows kissing his face and his blanket tucked under his chin, she could almost imagine he was as normal as a million other seven-year-old boys, dreaming of Saturday freedom, of parks and playgrounds, of gathering daisies. She kissed his brow and tiptoed from the room, closing the door silently behind her. Sam had taken the rocking chair near the window. Shamika sprawled on the sofa, feet propped on the coffee table cluttered with magazines, an empty cola can or two, and a stack of Val's folded clothes, fresh from the dryer and smelling like fabric softener. How about coffee? Leah asked, smiling at Sam. His old cheeriness had returned and he waved one hand in the air. Decaf if you have it, hon. Not me, Shamika yelled. Give me the real thing. I'm just liable to cruise on out to Mojo's here in a little while and I'm gonna need all the pick-me-up I can get. Just what the heck is a Mojo's? Sam asked Shamika as Leah turned back to the kitchen. After putting the kettle on and locating the two jars of instant coffee, Leah dove into the refrigerator, shoving aside leftover SpaghettiOs and Saran-wrapped peanut butter sandwiches until locating the last of the cheesecake she had purchased four days ago at an Albertson's deli. Leah? Shamika called. Just a minute. I've just found dessert. Leah, I think you'd better come here, sweetie. Something in Shamika's tone made Leah frown. Leaving the fridge door open, the plate of cheesecake wedges in her hand, she walked to the living room door. Shamika and Sam were standing still as scarecrows, staring down at the television, where a reporter stood before the blackened wreckage of a burned-out automobile, doing her best to talk over the shrieks of fire engines and the roar of helicopters. It appears the accident took place around two hours ago. As you can see, the bend in the road is extremely sharp, and the investigators on the scene are guessing that they were simply traveling too fast to handle the curve safely. Connie, can you tell us if alcohol could have been involved? Police won't speculate, Jan. We do know that Dolores and Johnny had earlier spent the evening with friends at Randy's Bar and Grill. From our understanding they left the bar around 9 o'clock, which would put the time of the accident around 9.15, 9.30 at the latest. Thank you, Connie. We'll go now to the hospital, where Carl Simpson is standing by.
Carl, have you any word yet on the condition of Johnny Whitehorse and Dolores Rainwater? Jan, the doctors and nurses here at the hospital are keeping a pretty tight lip regarding Johnny and Dolores's condition. Shortly after the ambulance arrived here there was some speculation that one, or both, had been killed instantly, but that rumor has not been confirmed or denied by anyone so far. We do have some witnesses, however, two young ladies who happened upon the accident and called 911 on their car phone. Ladies, did you observe if, in fact, there were survivors of this terrible crash? We really couldn't see much of anything other than the fire. We had no idea who it was even, not until we heard the police telling the paramedics. Oh God, I can't believe it's Johnny. The girl turned away, her hands covering her face. Carl looked back at the camera. There you have it Jan. I suspect that soon as word of this tragedy gets out there will be a great many more like her showing up here. As for myself, the thought of losing such a fine colleague as Dolores breaks my heart. Leah? Leah turned her head, did her best to focus on Shamika's face, only vaguely aware that the cheesecake and plate lay in a heap on her feet. What are they saying? she asked. Are they saying that Johnny is dead? Is that what they're saying? They don't know, yes they do. They're just not telling us. Sam moved up beside her and put his arm around her shoulder. Would you like to go to the hospital, hun? Leah nodded, her eyes still fixed on Shamika. Johnny can't be dead. Not my Johnny. I just danced with him. He said my hair made him hungry. She laughed. And he said I was the prettiest girl in the room. He asked me to go home with him, Shamika. Had I agreed then, he wouldn't. Sam is going to drive you to the hospital. I'll stay here with Val. Soon as you hear anything, you call me. Looking at Sam, she reiterated, call me. Chapter 10 The car radio imparted nothing but music. Why music, when Johnny Whitehorse might well be fighting for his life, or worse? Perhaps the DJ's silence was an omen, or a conspiracy to keep the world from knowing that another of its idols had been snuffed out too early. Like James Dean and Elvis and Princess Diana, beautiful, adored, misunderstood, isolated in a frenzy of a hungry, demanding populace whose own worries were eased by the trials and tribulations of their idols, Johnny's death would ultimately make him an icon to be worshipped. There would be movies about his life, books spewing rumors and innuendos he would be unable to refute. Leah turned the radio off. Johnny isn't dead, she said aloud, staring out the passenger window. I would know it if he was. I would know it here. She pressed her hand to her heart. Sam said nothing. The hospital parking lot was a blockade of police cars, television crews, and teenage girls clutching posters and magazine photos of Johnny to their hearts, tears streaming down their faces, holding one another in their arms, bodies shaking with grief. Sam wedged the Cadillac into a space behind a Channel 10 van, then looked at her with a gentle smile. You want me to go up first? You know, see what's happened? If they know anything yet? No. She shook her head and shoved open the door, leaving it open as she ran toward the emergency room entrance. The same reporter she had watched earlier, Carl Something, stood in a wash of bright lights, staring into a mini cam as he spoke into a microphone. We've just received confirmation of one fatality. Leah plowed through a pack of yelling news hounds, all thrusting microphones toward an obviously nervous physician whose responses to them were drowned out by shouts and more questions. As she sprinted toward the automatic door, someone caught her from behind. Whoa lady. Not so fast. Back behind the barricade, she twisted around, shoving at the officer's chest. I have to see Johnny, you're a little old for a groupie, aren't you? I'm a friend, yeah, that's what they're all saying. Please, look lady, are you a member of the family? He looked her up and down, grinning. I don't think so. The lady is a close friend, a voice said. She can go up with me. Leah turned. Roy Moon stood just outside the door, his hands in his pockets, his cowboy hat shoved back on his head. 
Roy, she whispered, her voice breaking. If you say so, Mr. Moon. The officer released her and returned to the barricade, where a dozen screaming girls were waving photos of Johnny in the air. Roy reached out his hand to her. She grabbed it, refusing to take her eyes from his. He said nothing, as usual, just escorted her into the hospital, where she was drowned by bright lights and the smell of disinfectant. Police loitered in the hallways, as did women in white uniforms and men in long white coats. A pair of men stood side by side at the end of the corridor, their jackets stamped coroner's office. Her step slowed and for an instant the peripheral world became a gray haze. In here, Roy said, directing her toward a door flanked by police with walkie-talkies strapped to one hip, a gun on the other. He shoved the door open and stepped aside, waiting for her to enter. Despite the noise in the corridor, the room was quiet. And cold. A group of doctors and nurses clustered around a body on a bed, speaking softly, jotting notes on clipboards. We'll continue the IV through the night. Check his stats every two hours. If he wakes up and needs something for pain I've noted his medication on his chart. I suspect he'll be out for a while, though. I gave him enough sedation earlier to put down an elephant. The group laughed quietly and turned for the door, filing past Leah and Roy as the physician with a somewhat twisted sense of humor smiled at Roy and motioned him toward the bed. You can come in now, Mr. Moon. I think we've about done all the damage we can do to Mr. Whitehorse, at least for the time being. Roy smiled at Leah. Go on. You first. The glare of the lights made Johnny's skin look pale. His face showed signs of bruises and abrasions. Cuts on his brow and chin had been closed with a few stitches. There were bandages securing an IV needle into the back of his hand, and there was grass in his hair, along with dry blood. Does he know about Dolores yet? Roy asked the doctor. He knows. He was awake when the paramedics brought him in. He took it pretty hard, which is one of the reasons I sedated him so heavily. I don't know how he managed to survive that wreck. I've seen it on the news. There's nothing left of the car. He was thrown clear. One of those rare times it paid not to have his seatbelt on. Miss Rainwater wasn't so lucky. Even if she had survived the impact by some miracle, the explosion would have killed her. It don't make sense, Doc. Johnny's a real good driver. He wouldn't do anything to jeopardize their lives. We're running blood tests for alcohol. He wasn't drunk, Leah said, reaching for Johnny's hand, frowning at how cold it felt, and unresponsive. We had dinner together. The four of us. He had two drinks. You have to know, Johnny Doctor. It takes a great deal more than a glass of champagne and a margarita to buzz him. Whatever caused that accident, it wasn't due to his driving drunk. The doctor put his chart aside. We're also running tests for drugs. Leah looked around. Don't bother. Johnny would never do drugs. He despises them and everything they stand for. Cocaine was found near the car, in the lady's purse. The doctor lowered his eyes. There will be an investigation, of course. If his tests show positive, he could be looking at a manslaughter charge. I suggest, Mr. Moon, that you contact his attorney as soon as possible. I can keep those cops out of here only so long. Come morning, when he wakes up, he's going to have a lot of answering to do. Roy nodded. I'll call him now. The doctor left the room. Roy stood at the end of the bed, hands slid into his back pockets as he watched Johnny sleep. You don't believe it, do you? Leah asked. You know Johnny would never touch drugs. Roy? Look at me. There was a bad time, after you left Ruidoso. He wasn't himself. He lost his pride, and his soul was angry. He had much pain in his heart. His spirit became his enemy. He turned to drugs and alcohol. I think he wanted to die. I found him one night, unconscious, a needle in his arm. I took him to his grandfather, and his grandfather called on the great spirit to repair and comfort his wounded soul. When Johnny returned to us, he was healed. But the emptiness of loss remained. He became like the eagle with one wing. He could no longer fly. 
The door opened and a nurse peered in. You'll have to go now. We'll be moving Mr. Whitehorse up to a room for the night. Leah bent over Johnny, searching his face. I'm here, she whispered. We'll get through this together. I won't leave you again, Johnny. I swear it. Sam waited in the hall, smiling as Leah left Johnny's room. He took her aside as a group of nurses and aides hustled into the room, followed by several police officers. He's going to be fine, Leah. I spoke with the doctor. They did extensive x-rays, nothing internal to cause problems. He'll be good as new in a few days. I'll drive you home. You can get some sleep and come back first thing in the morning. The door opened again. Johnny was rolled out into the hallway, flanked by nurses carrying IV bags. Officers closed in around him, their walkie-talkies squawking and buzzing with static. Two peeled away and moved to the end of the corridor, assuring that no overeager reporters would find their way beyond the outer barricade and zero in on Johnny's whereabouts. Elevator doors slid open, and Johnny disappeared from view. The fear and adrenaline rush that had vibrated Leah's nerves on the way to the hospital having subsided, she felt as if every inkling of energy, not to mention bone and muscle, had been drained from her body. As Sam drove them back to her house, she rode with her eyes closed, mind blank, sleep pulling at her consciousness like the moon on tide. Dolores Rainwater was dead. But Johnny was alive. In that moment that was all that mattered. Johnny was alive. She would see him tomorrow, and comfort him, assure him that all would be fine. She would again be his port in a storm. His rock of Gibraltar. Sam shook her. Raising her head, she blinked sleepily at the house, its windows blazing with light. Shamika stood in the door, arms crossed, staring out at the car. The Cadillac running and the radio turned low, Sam reached for Leah's hand and kissed it. Some night, huh? I'm awful sorry about Dolores. But at least Johnny is going to be okay. We can thank God for that. She smiled and curled her fingers around his. Thanks for helping me with Val earlier. He squeezed her hand. I'd say that I'd be more than happy to lend you a hand any time you need it, but I suspect, judging by watching you and Johnny together tonight, that there is more going on between you than simple friendship. Heck, I'm an overweight, balding used car salesman. I can hardly compete with Johnny Whitehorse. He laughed, sounding sad. Still, if things don't work out, I'll be around. You give me a call if you need anything at all, a shoulder to lean on. Someone to help you bathe Val if Shamika wants to cruise up to Mojo's. You're very special, Sam. Smiling, he leaned over the console and kissed her cheek. Get some rest. I'll give you a call tomorrow, see how Johnny is doing. Give Val a kiss for me. Leah nodded and left the car. She stood on the graveled path, watching as Sam backed down the drive. He honked the horn before pulling out onto the highway and driving off into the dark. Shamika opened the screen door for Leah as she mounted the porch. Nice guy is Sam. Sorry that I laughed at him earlier. Johnny's going to be fine. I know. They finally broke the news of Dolores's death about an hour ago. The reporter said something about the police finding cocaine in her purse. This could get very ugly, Leah. I'm certain the results of the blood tests will clear Johnny. Let's hope so. It's not going to look very good for him, considering he's been so outspoken about the use of drugs. God, he just did that anti-drug commercial. I don't want to talk about it, Shamika. Leah kicked off her shoes and tossed her sweater on the floor. She entered Val's bedroom, quietly lowered the bedside rail, and eased back his blanket. Val opened his eyes as Leah shimmied under the covers and nestled her head on the pillow next to his. Mama lonely? he asked. Not when I'm with you, she whispered, smiling into his eyes. An emergency call awoke her at 6.30 a.m., just as Clyde's automotive repair pulled into the driveway with her truck in tow. As Leah climbed out of her rumpled sundress and reached for her jeans, she listened to the tow driver explain to Shamika that all charges had been taken care of by Mr. Whitehorse. There were four new tires and a new wheel, the driver's window had been replaced, and the vehicle had been washed. 
The doctor might want to change the oil soon, however, and the spark plugs weren't looking so hot. If she cared to have it done at Clyde's, they would make her a real deal, considering she was such a good friend of Johnny's. Returning to the house, keys dangling from her finger, Shamika grinned at Leah as she pulled on a t-shirt and tucked it into her jeans. My, my, it does pay to have friends in high places. Charges taken care of by Mr. Whitehorse, huh? I'll pay him back. Leah snatched the keys from Shamika. Have you heard anything? Just that funeral arrangements for Dolores are pending. So what's the emergency? A horse with choke. Lovely. Will you want breakfast when you get back? Grabbing up her purse and cell phone, Leah started out the door. I'm going to the hospital afterward. If I get any more calls, direct them to Dean Crabbit. And give Val a big kiss for me when he wakes up. By the time she reached Dan Braden's quarter horses, a half-hour drive from Leah's, the horse's impaction had cleared itself. Just to be on the safe side, she hung around for another twenty minutes, making certain there were no more heaves or spewing, draining nostrils. She collected her $45 trip fee and headed for the hospital. There were no police cars and barricades. No weeping, screaming young women, no television crews. Something was up. The woman behind the registration desk peered at Leah over her bifocals. Mr. Whitehorse is no longer at this hospital. Leah checked her watch. It's only 8.30. Surely he hasn't. Left the hospital sometime last night, or early this morning. He was gone when I came on duty at 5.30. She smiled and shrugged. Sorry. Sitting in the truck at a red light, Leah called home. Shamika answered on the second ring. Has Roy Moon or Johnny called? Nope. Johnny's not at the hospital. That's good. It means he was well enough to leave. But the doctor said it was imperative that he stay the night for observation. Hun, from what you've told me about Mr. Whitehorse, I suspect he is going to do exactly what he wants to do. I doubt he's going to lay around in bed waiting for the vultures to land. He's going to find him a place to hole up for a while, keep out of the public eye while he gets his life back in order. I thought he might have called, is all. Silence. I guess there's no reason for him to call, is there? I mean unless Roy told him I was at the hospital last night. I'm sure Roy told him. The light changed and traffic surged around her. Sure you don't want some breakfast, Shamika asked. Why not? Disconnecting the call, Leah then threw the phone on the seat. There were two black cars parked in the driveway when Leah arrived home. Truck idling, she sat behind the steering wheel, staring at the government-issue license plates, feeling her stomach form a fist-sized knot. She thought of making an about-face and heading back to Braden's, just to make positively certain his horse was not still choking, but then a man in a brown sports coat got out of one of the cars and stood staring at her. She could hardly make an unnoticed getaway now. She drove around the cars, ignoring the watchful driver, and parked by the barn. There was no use in stalling the inevitable, so she headed for the house, then peered through the screen door with her hands cupped around her eyes. Shamika sat at the kitchen table, softly encouraging Val to feed himself from the pile of scrambled eggs on his plate. Leah, quietly as possible, stepped into the kitchen. Shamika looked around, eyebrows raised. Where is he? Leah whispered. Waiting in the living room. Watching CNN, of course. I'll warn you, he's not happy. What have I done now? Better have a look at that. Shamika thumbed toward a newspaper on the table. Picking up the paper, Leah opened it to the headlines and a color photo of Dolores's smashed, blackened car. Dolores's and Johnny's pictures were side by side. The caption reading, News Correspondent Killed Instantly in Fiery Crash. Whitehorse Under Investigation. Frowning, Leah shook her head. What's this got to do with my father and me? Turn the page. Wait. Maybe you should sit down first. Leah opened the paper. There was a photo center page. She and Johnny dancing together at Randy's Bar and Grill, smiling into one another's eyes, bodies close, a portrait of lovers. When the hell did they take that, she said to herself. 
To summarize the story, you and Johnny are an item. A very juicy tidbit considering Johnny is out to destroy the senator. According to the valet at Randy's, Dolores left the restaurant in a huff of jealousy after finding you two, wrapped in one another's arms on the dance floor. She and Johnny had a terrible fight in the parking lot. Things got really ugly. Lots of screaming, crying, and profanity. They even scuffled. Johnny drove away from the restaurant like a bat out of hell. Shit. I'd say that was putting it mildly. Shamika gave Val a big smile and popped a piece of egg in his mouth. Would you like me to take Val for a drive? She shook her head and tossed the paper onto the table. I'll handle it. Besides, I may need some backup. Rubbing her hands on her jeans, Leah moved to the living room where her father, Senator Foster, sat on the sofa, his gaze fixed on a CNN correspondent reporting on some catastrophe in India, a barge sinking and drowning 200 passengers. She stared at the back of his gray head, wishing she had taken the time to grab a glass of water. Her mouth always went dry as sand in his presence. Hi, she said, trying to sound cheery and failing miserably. This is a surprise. Have you read the morning paper? He replied. Just like you, Dad. Get right to the point. Forget about trivialities like, hello sweetheart, long time no see, how are you, and most importantly, how is my grandson? If you're referring to the story of me and Johnny, I only just saw it as I came in the door. Come around here so I can see you. She walked around the sofa, then stopped between the senator and the television. He looked her up and down, shaking his head. You look like shit. You're a goddamn bag of bones. Don't you eat? When I have time. Thank God your mother isn't alive to see what you've become. Living in this dump like some poor white trash, looking like a scarecrow, smelling like a pile of horse shit. I cringe every time I think of what you gave up when divorcing Richard. Richard walked out on me dad. Remember? He made a noise and shook his head. Can you blame him? Who the hell wants a wife who smells like horse shit all the time? who can't be bothered to wear a dress now and again, or put on makeup, or brush her hair for that matter. The man was a saint to stay with you as long as he did. There came a clatter of dishes from the kitchen, a slamming of a cupboard door. Leah crossed her arms and took a deep breath. Get to the point, Dad. The point is, you're back with that goddamned Indian again. I'm not back with Johnny. You were photographed together last night. By now the Associated Press has picked up that story and plastered it from California to Istanbul. Jesus H. Christ Leah. The man has been trying to torch my ass for the last two years. He has all but publicly said that I'm a crook, and here you are dancing cheek to cheek with the son of a bitch. Do you realize how that looks? Just where the hell is your loyalty? Leah cleared her throat. I danced once with Johnny. Once. I was at Randy's with a date, not Johnny. You can ask anyone there. Besides, it's really none of your business who I date. I'm not a child any longer, Senator. I'm a grown woman, and if I want to date Saddam Hussein I'll date him. Foster left the sofa, and Leah stepped back. His face flushed red, his lips pressed so tightly against his teeth they looked white. You can tell your Indian heartthrob that if he thinks he's going to ruin me, he's got another think coming. Straightening his tie and buttoning his coat, Foster laughed to himself. Of course, who the hell is going to believe a druggie? Soon as those drug test results come back, proving he was strung out on cocaine when he went off that road, he's history. The district attorney will bury him so far in prison he'll be an old man before he ever sees daylight again. Foster walked from the room. Leah listened to his footsteps as he moved down the hall. The screen door slammed. She ran to the door, her throat tight with all the words she wanted to scream at him. As the driver opened the rear car door he dropped into the seat, glancing back at the house as the man in the brown sports coat shut the door, obliterating her father's face behind the tinted glass. The second black car backed down the drive and waited for her father's sedan to pull out onto the highway before falling in behind it. Seems he was in one of his better moods today, Shamika said behind her. He's such an ass. If the voters only knew. 
You okay? He'll call tonight and apologize. He always does. He might even send flowers. Monday, he'll send Val a present, maybe some money. And I'll forgive him, again. Because each time he apologizes and says he'll never lose his temper at me again like that, I'll hope like hell that maybe this time he means it and there might be a smidgen of a chance that he'll turn out to be human after all. Do you really think that's going to happen, Leah? No. She shook her head. Not a chance. Chapter 11 The Sunday papers were ablaze with photos, innuendos, speculations, and condemnations of Johnny Whitehorse. Was he simply another icon too good to be true? Had he managed to dupe his adoring public? And what about his people, the Native Americans whom he represented as an example of what they were capable of becoming? The interview on the local news with her father did not help. He gloated over the fact that Johnny had publicly insinuated that the senator was involved in corruption of the reservation casinos, and here he was obviously involved in drugs. The public could be assured that the senator would be encouraging an all-out investigation of Mr. Whitehorse. When asked what he thought of his daughter's relationship with Whitehorse, the senator looked directly into the camera and replied, I adamantly deny that my daughter is involved with Johnny Whitehorse. They are acquaintances. Nothing more. My daughter and I have an incredibly close relationship. She would never associate with a man like Whitehorse, especially knowing how he has publicly massacred my reputation the last few months. By Sunday afternoon Leah had called Johnny's house no less than a dozen times, always getting his answering service. The first few times she left a message. Urgent. Call Leah. Later, her frustration mounting, she'd simply hung up in the service's ear. Why don't you just get in the truck and go see him? Shamika asked. I don't want to seem pushy. Since when were you ever concerned about that? He must be going through incredible worry. Maybe he needs a shoulder to lean on. Considering what my father's been saying, I'm probably the last person he'd want to lean on. Might be nice to assure him that your father doesn't speak for you. As I recall, he never did. What if he rejects me, Shamika? He might. But I doubt it. Go, girl. You're not going to have a moment's peace until you do. Leah made the drive over to Johnny's house in less than two minutes. The front iron gates were shut and locked against the curious and concerned fans milling around the entrance, hoping to get a glance of Johnny. The dozen bodyguards positioned along the entry and the stretch of fence lining the highway made certain that the women's attempts to shimmy over the barricade were unsuccessful. Engine idling, her fingers tapping the steering wheel as she collected her thoughts and watched a guard tackle an enthusiastic fan who attempted to climb the gates, Leah assessed the situation until a truck pulled up behind her and blasted its horn. She drove south down the highway until she came to a barely visible track between a cluster of pines. By the looks of the weeds growing amid the tire marks, a few years had passed since the road had been used. No telling what she might run into along the way. Leah eased the truck off the highway and onto the sandy track. As brush scraped along the undercarriage, the truck bounced like a buckboard wagon into and out of the old ruts. The forest closed in around her, a wall of pines and cedars and wild berry bushes. The air became tangy with their scents, rousing memories of lazy picnics in pine needle covered hiding places, her mind drowsy with love, desire, and warm red wine. She and Johnny had discussed building a home in these trees, hidden away, wrapped up in nature and thumbing their noses at the hectic, prejudiced world. She almost missed the fence opening. Over the years, weeds and bushes had almost swallowed it. Leaving the truck, Leah waded through the overgrowth, jimmied with the gate latch that had become rusty over the years, and finally gave it a hard kick that sent the corroded metal flying through the air in two pieces. She was forced to pick up the gate end and shove it through the high grass to make room for the truck to pass through, onto White Horse Farm property. The trail leading back to the house had long since grown over. Following the fence line, her memory leading the way, Leah wove through the rises and gullies that she had once ridden horseback over, 
long before she had fallen in love with Johnny Whitehorse, back when her world was made up of make-believe, her companions those only in her imagination. Her mother had been alive then, and sometimes joined her. They would spend hours exploring their domain. Her mother would take dozens of photographs and return home to paint them on canvas, selling them in shops that specialized in supporting local artists. Topping a hill, Leah hit the brakes. Before her stretched the compound, glistening like a scattering of polished white stones under the afternoon sun. The house, the barns, the offices. The mile-long exercise track formed an oval of rich brown dirt, starting gates at one end, observation booth at the other where Johnny's father would wait, stopwatch in hand, for her father's horses to streak across the finish line. She had never been able to judge Jefferson Whitehorse's thoughts by his expressions, whether he was pleased or unhappy over a horse's running time. That was simply the way it was with the Apache. Only their eyes gave away their thoughts and feelings. They either embraced you, or cut you to the bone. She drove to the house, parking beside Johnny's truck near a bench under a tree. There were several cars scattered along the drive. A BMW, a Jaguar XJS with the convertible top down, a Jeep Cherokee. The door opened at her knock. A tall man with broad shoulders and no hair, wearing an extremely well-cut and expensive suit, peered down at her through his John Lennon-style glasses. How the hell did you get in here, he demanded. Geez, where is that security? He stepped around her, onto the porch, searching the grounds. Leah slipped into the house and was halfway across the foyer before the man turned and shouted, Hey, come back here. Damn it. Where is security? I'm a friend of Johnny's, she said without looking back. There were voices coming from the study. She headed there. A collection of suited men sat in chairs, a couple smoking cigars that clouded the room in a dingy haze. Leah knew immediately that Johnny would not be among them. He did not allow smoking in his company. In fact, had he been anywhere on the premises, the cigars would be tucked away in the men's briefcases. Their talk came to an abrupt stop as they stared at her. The bald man she'd left at the front door moved up behind her. We have company, gentlemen. Does anyone know where security has gone? What am I paying those sons of bitches for? Where is Johnny? Leah asked, making eye contact with an older gentleman who did not seem so perturbed by her entrance. I hoped you could tell us Ms. Foster. Sorry. I meant Mrs. Starr. He rolled the cigar between his lips before adding, Gentlemen, this is Senator Foster's daughter. The young lady in the paper dancing with Johnny? I believe they're old friends. Jesus, the bald man muttered, stepping around her. That's all we need. I assure you gentlemen, I'm here strictly on my behalf. Not my father's. I haven't heard from Johnny since the accident. He hasn't returned my phone calls. I'm concerned. That makes four of us. The man with no hair adjusted his glasses. I'm Edwin Fullerman. Johnny's agent. We were just discussing you. We'd hoped you might have spoken with Johnny. No. She shook her head. The gentleman she'd addressed first left his chair and extended one hand. I'm Robert Anderson, Johnny's legal advisor. This gentleman over here is Roger Darnali, Johnny's business manager, and this is Jack Hall, public relations advisor. We all flew in last night, for whatever good it's done us. No one seems to know where the hell our client is. Not even Roy Moon? Edwin rolled his eyes. Trying to get anything out of that man is impossible. He'll talk to me. Johnny's agent dropped onto a leather sofa and crossed his legs. Great. Terrific. Go to it. You might tell him to pass on to my client that his silence and sudden disappearance are not exactly going to endear him to the advertisers who have spent millions on ad campaigns plastered with his face and body. Jesus. He leapt from the sofa, arms thrown open as he stared at the ceiling and yelled, we're talking frigging $10 million in endorsements here. Not to mention the impact this will have on his own companies. Darnali interjected as he flipped open a file and ran his finger down a compilation of numbers. Whitehorse Jeans had the third highest sales profits for jeans for the first quarter of this year, both in this country and Japan. Christ. 
He shook his head. Johnny's bigger than Buddha in Japan. One hint of scandal and he's cooked. You can imagine how my conversation went with Craig Morris at the Celebrities for a Drug-Free America this morning. Just last week we finalized a deal with NBC and the National Football League to air a 30-second commercial of Johnny's anti-drug rhetoric during the next Super Bowl. Johnny would have made the cover of Newsweek again. Oh, and did I fail to mention what that little coup would have meant if we got around to negotiating the Costner-Redford deal? We're talking 15 million easy. Jack Hall studied the tip of his cigar. We'll simply get him into Betty Ford, explain that the pressures of his success became too much. I'll point out to Craig Morris that this slip of Johnny's could make one hell of a point. See what disasters befall you when you succumb to drugs. He grinned. Brilliant. Think about it. All this publicity. Rainwater's death, his beloved fiance. I'll call the Inquirer, promise them an exclusive if they really make an issue of Johnny's grief. I'll slip them a few photos of the funeral, great. Ed shook his head. While you're at it, slip them a few photos of Johnny in prison for manslaughter and possession. He's hardly going to be able to do the Costner-Redford deal when he's serving 10 to 20, is he? He should have thought about that. Wait a minute, Leah shouted, causing the men to shut up and look at her as if forgetting she had been there in the first place. You're all talking about Johnny as if he's already been tried and found guilty of something. Listen to yourselves. Not one of you has shown any concern whatsoever for anything other than what this may or may not do to his ability to make money. Excuse me, make you money. Have you stopped to consider his feelings? What he must be suffering, and I don't mean because he might lose an endorsement or won't get his picture on the front of Newsweek again. Dolores Rainwater is dead, and if any of you jerks had ever taken the time to get to know Johnny, you'd realize that he must be dealing with incredible guilt, not to mention his sorrow over losing a friend. They stared. Fullerman sat on the desk edge and crossed his arms. His up and disappearing doesn't exactly paint a positive picture, Miss Foster. The name is Star Mr. Fullerman. And if your reference to my maiden name is somehow a means of linking me with my father, then you can stuff it. What problems may exist between Johnny and my father have absolutely nothing to do with me. I have no intention of taking sides on their issues. You may be forced to, Anderson said. As Johnny's legal counsel, I must say that the allegations your father is publicly making about Johnny border on slander. If Johnny is found to be clear of drugs, of course. Should Johnny decide to sue, I suspect your father will be hard-pressed to collect enough money to satisfy us, much less finance his upcoming election. Is that a threat? She said through her teeth. Simply a fact, Mrs. Star. If you have any influence with your father whatsoever, I suggest that you relay this little conversation to him pointing out that a lawsuit slapped on a man of his prominence will have major consequences down the line. Should he ever decide to run for a higher office? Leah backed toward the door, shaking her head. You're all a lot of hyenas. Just businessmen Mrs. Starr, Hall said, tapping cigar ashes into a container the shape of the state of New Mexico. With a very lucrative commodity at stake. Johnny Whitehorse is worth a cool hundred million in endorsements and television and movie projects, not to mention Whitehorse, Inc., revenue. In short, should Johnny decide to, he has the financial capability of squashing your father's bank account like a cockroach. Turning on her heels, Leah left the room, stalked from the house, and stood beneath the tree near her truck, doing her best to control her anger before getting behind the wheel. Leah pulled the truck onto the highway shoulder and shut off the engine. Ahead of her, on the side of the road, were two cars, windows rolled down as the occupants focused their long lens cameras on the crash site and snapped away. Souvenirs of death. Leah wondered if the photos would take their place inside someone's picture album or find their way to the tabloids, for a hefty reward, of course. Obviously, anything to do with Johnny was worth a tidy sum even if it depicted tragedy, especially if it depicted tragedy. A half dozen or so flower wreaths had been placed amid the blackened and scarred earth where Dolores's car had collided with the ground and burst into flames. There was evidence of the police investigation. Strips of yellow ribbon fluttered from charred tree trunks, 
their lower limbs, stripped of their needles, looking skeletal. The grass, what had been spared from the inferno, had been flattened by numerous car tracks. Finally, the cars pulled away. Leah left the truck and stood on the hot asphalt, feeling the heat of the day seep up through the soles of her boots as she scanned the area. A stench of gasoline and ashes hung in the air, as did the unusual and discomfiting silence. A double stretch of black rubber lay imprinted along the road's surface, stretching perhaps fifty feet before disappearing off the shoulder. Leah followed the tire marks, toe to heel, balancing on the strip as if she were a tightrope walker until coming to the end, where the marks took an abrupt jag to the right, almost a perfect ninety-degree angle. Very odd. Hands on her hips, she stared down the embankment, to the place where the car had hit first, rolling back the earth, then again, further, where it had come to rest, wheels up. Where, she wondered, had Johnny fallen? Had he witnessed the horrible explosion, knowing that Dolores was still strapped in the car, knowing there was no way of helping her? Or had he been unconscious? Please, God, let him have been unconscious. A crow cawed from above, circling the clearing floating on outstretched black wings before diving into the trees. Cupping her hand over her eyes, Leah searched the tree line beyond the accident site. Some niggling disquietude tapped at her, as if there were something there she should be seeing, but couldn't. Sort of like the Where's Waldo pictures that always made her crazy with frustration. She knew it was there, laid out for her to recognize, though what it was was a total mystery. This particular bend in the road had been a major source of despondency for a number of people through the years. During her senior year in high school the curve had claimed three lives, each going too fast to make the curve safely. How many times had she and Johnny so foolishly pushed the limits of safety in his father's old truck, racing ninety to nothing to get her home and back in bed before sunup, before her father realized that she'd spent the night making love to an Indian? Funny, but she'd never been frightened of the drive with Johnny. He'd handled the bends in the road as gracefully and competently as he made love, a man in total control of his actions. The place where the car had come to rest was a flat hollow some fifty yards from the road. There were shreds of metal strewn over the ground. The larger rocks scattered around the clearing showed evidence of metallic blue paint. What was she doing here? Leah thought. She was feeling a lot like a rubbernecker at a particularly grisly accident, slowing down to catch a glimpse of gore. I wondered how long it would take you to come here, came a voice near the tree line. She spun around, her heart pounding. Roy Moon stepped from the shadows. You're looking for Johnny? She nodded. You won't find him here, Roy said. Why are you here? She asked. I am here for Johnny. Searching. For what? Roy stepped over a rotting tree branch, his footsteps cautious and silent. His cowboy hat had been replaced by a bandana tied around his wide, brown brow. He wore knee-high moccasins instead of boots. By the looks of his sweat-damp shirt he had been nosing around the site for some time. It became apparent that Roy had no intention of answering her question, so she did not bother asking again. Will you tell me where Johnny is? What good will you do him? He replied, stopping beside her. He shouldn't be alone, Roy. It is his choice, I think. But do you think it's wise, considering what you told me at the hospital? He studied the area with sharp eyes. He must be suffering, she said. Roy nodded. If I take you there, you must promise to keep his secret. I swear. I risk his trust by doing so. He'll be glad I've come. Without another word, Roy turned back to the forest. Leah fell in behind him. They walked a long while until coming out on a dirt road where Roy had parked his truck, well hidden from view from the highway. Leah climbed in and they made the ride in silence through the trees, finally coming out on a blacktop road that wound north toward the reservation. After a half-hour's ride, Roy pulled up in front of a tiny adobe hut. An old man sat in a ladder-back chair on the porch, fanning himself in the heat. The engine still running, Roy looked over at Leah. You know Johnny's grandfather. She nodded, feeling a flutter of nervousness in her stomach.
The old man had been totally opposed to his grandson's relationship with Leah those many years ago. Like Johnny's father, he looked at her as one more object to lure Johnny's loyalties away from his people. She was very certain they had celebrated her and Johnny's breakup with much pleasure. Killing the engine, Roy left the truck. Wait here. I'll speak to the old man alone. It will be up to him whether you see Johnny. She nodded and watched as Roy mounted the porch and sat on an overturned crate next to Johnny's grandfather. As Roy spoke too softly for Leah to hear, the old man stared out at her, his expression inscrutable. God, it was hot. The first really hot day of the summer. The sun beat down on the line of hovels, shimmered in waves off the roofs and weed-thatched gardens, reflected off the barren ground so the glare made Leah squint. Closing her eyes and doing her best to ignore the sweat forming under her clothes, Leah leaned her head back against the seat, allowing memories to rise like threads of hazy smoke in her mind. The first time she'd ever noticed Johnny Whitehorse had been the spring of her sophomore year in high school. She supposed that he'd been around for nearly a year, since his father had come to work at the farm, but she'd been too wrapped up in cheerleading, student council, and keeping her grades up to realize there was actually a life around her own house. Her study at the time had been the quarterback for the football team, blonde, blue-eyed Larry Norman. He drove a black Corvette convertible and lived in the second finest house in Ruidoso, hers having been the finest, of course. Larry was dumb as a box of rocks, but it didn't matter, not with his throwing arm. Half the colleges in the country were trying to lure Larry Norman with scholarships. She'd always thought it rather sad that someone with his father's money could get his education paid for entirely just because he could throw a football. Larry had brought her home from school one day after cheerleading in football practice. Gunning the vet up the drive, he'd come within feet of plowing into Johnny and the horse he was riding. The animal reared straight up on its back legs, yet Johnny handled the situation with all the adeptness of his ancestors, whispering to the horse in Apache, his expression saying nothing of what he was really thinking. Larry laid into his horn and shouted, Hey, Geronimo, wanna watch where you're going? Leah slapped him on the arm. Dingbat. Watch where you're going, why don't you? As Larry eased the car by the skittish horse, she looked up into Johnny's eyes and smiled. Sorry, she called. He did not reply, just watched her, perhaps hypnotizing her a little, causing her existence to hone to a pinpoint that made her heart ache. It had been all she could do to turn away from him, and for the remainder of the night she'd tossed and turned in her bed, thinking of the Indian with haunting eyes.